Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, December 17th, 2015 Hopkinton School Committee regular meeting. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance, Pledge of Allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll run through the agenda. We're going to start with recognitions. Then we'll have our first opportunity for public comment, followed by reports. And then we'll have a bu budget presentation from the middle school, the high school, and athletics. That'll be followed by new business, high school girls field hockey trip, capital project school department article, a joint capital project with the town, uh, the MCAS park participation and recommendation from Superintendent, budget transfer request, and there's no old business, and we'll have a second opportunity for a public comment. So, Dr. McLeod, would you like to start with recognitions for Thank the Hopkinton <coughs> Education Foundation? Thank you. Yes, um, I'd like to invite um, Alexis Miller and Janine Pashuter and Jennifer Andrews, if you could come up um, here. Don't know where. Can we? Can we go? Where you like? I have mine right here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Alexis has just handed out to you uh, a summary of the projects that were funded um, this year. But before we get to there, uh, I just wanted to recognize um, that half the Hopkinton Education Foundation and the Hopkinton Parent Teacher Association have really, in recent years, really been joining forces and really trying to figure, work together collaboratively in terms of the different ways, the many and varied ways that you support our schools and our teachers. And it's been really wonderful working with all of you. I think there's been a tremendous amount of effort that goes into the work. And to identify areas where you are, can differ and therefore put your energies in differently has been really great. And so there's actually, I don't think you got a copy of this, but there, yep. did they? It's in your handout. I mean, the different ways that the Education Foundation, you know, comparing their mission statements and then the varied ways, ways that they, um, they support our schools, including the different focus that they have for their fundraising efforts, I think has just been an example of really wonderful collaboration um, from our parent community. Well, I'd like to thank um, Sherry Grady on, from the Ed Foundation and Erin Graziano and the HPCA did a fabulous job putting that together. They worked really hard on it. so. And we will be recognizing them in the new year as well. Good. Um, but thank you for that. So. Um, I'm just going to review just briefly, and you can jump in the process. Um, I met with Alexis last week, and we were talking about how do we get more teachers to, to, to put in grants, you know, to complete grants and, and submit them, um, and the ways in which we can support them in those endeavors. And one of the things that we spoke about was before you even go to the work of submitting a grant, have a conversation with the principal because the building principal reviews all of the grant submissions before there and has to sign off on them. So we all know how busy our teachers are. We feel that they're not going to put the effort into completing the grant process if they think that there's not a good chance of them getting it, right? So they want to know conceptually, is this something that even will be um, something that would be considered? So working together with HEF and our principals to make sure that the things that teachers are putting their effort into will be at least considered is I think a step in, in that right direction. Every school has um, at least one, most of them have two liaisons that are that build relationships with the principals and we encourage the teachers to reach out to those liaisons at any time to discuss a grant in advance. We can help them tweak it so that it actually is more appealing for us to fund. Um, we can tell them, you know what, maybe you need to rethink that. <laughs> and save them the trouble of filling out an entire application and spending hours and hours on it and then having us not accept it. Because that's disheartening for us as well as the grant applicant. And, and you, you think that perhaps that, that could be one of the reasons for a decline in applications because yes. there's a, maybe some misunderstanding about what 
Sometimes what you're I all think about. there's some people that don't quite grasp what our concept is, mm -hmm. and um, we have some clear guidelines that we have tried to publish to them. But I think sometimes a one-on-one -on -one conversation makes it a little easier. Right. And an example that you gave in my office was that there there was a time when there was something that was supported by half, but actually couldn't be supported through our technology at the time, which has now been greatly improved, but that led to frustration. So really working carefully with the school department, with the technology department, not that all the grants are technology based, but um, and also wanting to really one of your goals is to ensure that that the most students can have access to yep. whatever the grant is funding. Yeah, a grant, the same yeah. grant would be more appealing if it reached an entire school as opposed to just five kids. So with that said, um, I'm going to just review, quickly review the, the, um, the projects that were funded for this school year, um, and then I'll let you give a plug for your big fundraiser. Okay. Okay. So integrating the maker mindset at Hopkins School was supported. Um, I'm going to read a little bit of the summary just for the, for the folks at home. Um, it will transform the current technology and library curriculum for all fifth graders. So here's an example of something that will affect all students using self-directed inquiry-based learning through hands-on approaches to solving problems. Um, also, uh, you know, clearly connected to our strategic plan. Um, so that's another right. really nice connection. Um, at the high school, enhancing the digital art curriculum through interactive experience. And this grant will provide students with a new way to exhibit, publish, display, critique, and experience their digital masterpieces via a digital gallery in a public space. And I'm sure we have all noticed that. When you can't help but notice it the minute you walk into the high school, it's just fantastic. Um, and talk, talk about affecting everybody, everybody that walks into that building. The building in addition yeah. to all the art students. Right, it's wonderful. Um, at, also at the high school, Maker Magic, Create, Discover, Learn at the Hopkinton uh, High School Makerspace. And this grant creates a makerspace at Hopkinton to invite student curiosity, foster student-driven inquiry, again, based learning, and encourage collaboration and innovation. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that one? So a makerspace is um, in the technology sector and, and, and for example, in South Boston has been a big thing where you have a whole bunch of different people in the same space using a variety of tools to kind of learn and with each other and you, you might have a computer and a sewing machine together and all those things kind of collaborate and people bounce ideas off of someone that's in a completely different universe than they are to kind of brainstorm with someone just outside of what they're used to to get a, a fresh idea on something. So bringing that concept um, of collaboration and innovation to the schools in a portable unit so it can go to multiple places so you're not fighting over one, not trying to find a space which is at a premium, <laughs> um, made it really unique bringing it into the schools. It's very similar to the concept that they're trying to address at the fifth grade level with the one in Hopkins, um, but it's much more advanced for the high school students. And then finally, also at the high school, um, the Innovation Lab. And this grant creates an inspiring student learning space that will serve as an incubator for a more innovative approach to classroom design through the Hopkinton School System. And uh, that you will be hearing more about innovation in the high school budget um, to come later on this evening. But That's exciting yes, to hear. Yes, yes. Um, so thank you for funding all of these grants. And I'm, I'm really excited about, again, about their, their, how they're connected to the strategic plan and opportunities for innovation and collaboration and inquiry. All are things that are priorities for us as we move forward. Um, and so was it hard to make these choices? It is a challenge. Um, we have a group of people that involve some of our liaisons and other board members that get together and we read through the grants. There's always a couple of clear favorites and a couple of clear less favorites and then we debate back and forth over the course of several nights to figure out which ones are going to make the cut. Sometimes it comes down to budget, sometimes it comes down to, you know, we just flat out take a vote and, and that's how it come, it's decided. Right. Um, two years ago we had so many grants that we wanted to fund. We just we spent the most money we'd ever spent in one year and, and still had five more grants that we wish we could <coughs> So um, it's, uh, it's always fun to give money to someone so they can do what they <laughs> well, want we'll with it. it. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so, but speaking of money, so what, yep. what is your big fundraiser? I um, think it's in February. So, yes, every yeah. year we have um, several fundraisers. Uh, the next one coming up is going to be our Grand Gala. Um, it's going to go back to, we've had some different, uh, different options in the past, but we're going back to kind of a dinner dance okay. theme. Um, it's going to be at the Verve in Natick. It's going to be on February 27th, and we're going to have our standard silent auction there. So we're looking for a couple things. Um, we're looking for people to attend, because mm -hmm. that's always a fun night. Um, we're also looking for anyone that has some great ideas. We're looking a little bit more for unique experiences in the auction this year, um, trying to think outside the box. Obviously, you know, everyone's going to want a gift card to Pantai, but we'd also like to do some, some more fun things, like maybe lunch with the principal or something like that. Um, <laughs> that's outside the box. <laughs> Something, you know, some people, little kids might get excited about, you know, having a special lunch with their principal or just a couple of different things that typically money can't buy. So um, I hope well, you all you. are interested in attending. Thank you so much. Thank you for your support. We really appreciate the support of the school committee and, and the superintendent's office. So thank you all. Nice job, thank ladies. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, you too. You're still on a lot. Now go back to your web browser. Now you're there. So next we have our student council report. We don't have a student here, so we'll move on to the ESBC report, Mr. Graziano. Thank you. Um, so elementary school building committee has been busy over the past couple of weeks. Um, what we have started doing since the um, that we received approval to for funding for the new school building is we've begun the design development process. Um, and the design development process is basically going deeper into the schematic design um, that everybody is familiar with at this point um, and really looking at it by category. And this is done in two stages right now. The first one is um, user group meetings, which are occurring weekly. Um, Dr. McLeod is collaborating with our architect, DRA, um, to ensure that the right people are involved across each topic. And then their findings and recommendations are brought to the the full elementary school building committee for discussion. Um, at our last meeting, which was held last week on the 14th, we discussed the site plan um, as well as um, lead certification and lead features and um, utilities. And it was a great. Uh, it was a great meeting. We got to see some some conceptual designs from our landscape architects um, to look at some creative ways in which we can use the outdoor space at the building. Um, start to look at some different surfaces that will be used for the play spaces. Um, there was a lot of rich discussion about the connection to EMC Park and what that would look like and really landed on making sure that we have a connection to the, the Parks and Rec Department because there was some discussion about how that path would be most effective, which parts of it would be lighted and not, and some of that falls within the school land, some of that falls within the Parks and Rec land. Um, and then with respect to LEED, um, we are still targeting a LEED Silver certified um, building, taking advantage of a number of different um, green uh, design functions within the building. Currently, our um, architects believe that we have, so in order to get LEED Silver, the MSBA has a number of different things you can get to earn points, so different design features um, within the building. Um, you need 50 to be LEED Silver certified, which gives you two more reimbursement points. Um, and we're currently projecting those two more reimbursement points. We know we've got at least 56 that we feel very comfortable we're going to be able to get. And they're actually hoping to get us over 60, which would put us into a LEED Gold certification. It doesn't give us any more reimbursement points, but that's obviously not the only reason that we're, um, that we're doing, um, that we're pushing for those LEED functions. So. Um, it's really fun to see the the district and the architects really collaborating and trying to push this as a priority because that's something we definitely heard from the community. Um, the other big development is we're in the process of hiring our construction manager. Um, we put that out to bid and received seven submissions from construction managers. Um, the subcommittee We'll be reviewing those submissions, narrowing it down to a few finalists, and conducting interviews with those construction managers um, to have a recommendation back to the full elementary school building committee. I believe the target for that is not, so we, our next meeting is in January, but I don't believe that we're targeting it for then. I think it would be for the February meeting. 
Um, but everything is proceeding along on track. Um, and Dr. Can McLeod, I add Mr. Dumas. Just the user meetings. Do you mind if I? Add uh, please do, because, yeah, there? because I know you. I don't. Yeah. I'm, so behind the scenes, and I think. No one yeah. can hear Talk you. really loud. Sorry, behind the scenes, and I think it's important for people to be aware of the, the level of detail in order to prepare to go to ESBC. We have a weekly users gr user group and with the architects, and the user group is depending on who they're taking up that week. So this week it was the element, it was the preschool teachers, kindergarten teachers, and first grade teachers, and they came in, you know, we had invited them at different times. Um, we were there for three hours. The level of detail right down, we had a lengthy, lengthy conversation on the toilets. <laughs> and you know, I thought, and I said to the architect, seriously, you can see in a pre-K-1 building how important the toilets are. <laughs> so, um, you know, the fact that teachers can weigh in, we had a conversation about the number of tables and well we don't need that many tables because we work in centers and we certainly don't need dedicated computer tables because we work, work off of mobile iPad cards and um, for me having not gone through this before it was really fascinating to understand what has to happen all of these steps that take place to design a building that really is going to meet the educational program that we've that we, that is our vision within the district. So very exciting. I think it's wonderful to give for the teachers to feel part of this process, that their voice is heard, um, and that their needs are being listened to as we design the building space. Um, so that was last week. What we'll then do is provide an overview at the ESBC so that they they have the opportunity to also weigh in, um, but having already done kind of that that work in the background so that that was just the update this week and thank you for for, for that highlight because I think the other thing that people aren't necessarily aware of is that this is where some of the key decisions are made about the building and that while the building is going to provide us a lot more space um, f than the current building we are still limited by certain parameters and and the the user groups have been making I think some really critical decisions like Dr. McLeod indicated and there were two in particular that I that were notable from the last meeting and the first one was looking at how they could m best maximize the workspace um, in the the teacher workspace and as is sort of typical there are some typical aspects to these designs and one of them was the faculty workroom and the duplication room and the user groups quickly identified that we had well we had to reconfigure some of the administrative space in terms of how it, it, it would look and in order to make it easier and maximize the space the, it was the user group that was the first to say why do we need a separate duplication room we don't we don't Xerox as much as we used to and that number is only going down so these are the kind of creative solutions that are going on and the other thing that I thought was um, really interesting from the last meeting that I think is worth noting is one of the, the spaces that we don't talk about because we talk about so much about the educational program as well we should um, is the, the maintenance office in this building and this was a topic of co some conversation at the meeting because I think we were all caught off guard by this is actually going to include something that we don't have currently in the entire district and that's a workshop. Mm -hmm. So there will actually be workshop space so that Mr. Rogers and his staff can actually do some basic repairs that we don't even we can't even do today just based on space so if a desk breaks if a chair breaks and it's something that just needs to be brought in um, to be fixed and could be reasonably easily fixed we don't have a space to do that today and I'm not sure it, across the entire district not just in center school and so this will be a benefit to the entire maintenance staff and the entire school district just to have what seems like a fairly simple space mm -hmm. it's exciting so our next meeting, the user group meetings are continuing, um, although I assume they'll stop. We will not meet this when, right. next Wednesday, but they'll start up yeah. January the 6th. And I think our next meeting is January the 20th, 20th. the Elementary School Building yeah. Committee. So, Thanks. Any other liaison reports? Um, I met with the CPAC this week, and there was quite a bit of discussion on a few different topics. There was discussion about the IEP process and how to demystify and make it less stressful for parents. Um, there was also a lot of discussion about progress reports and differences in um, how the progress reports are drafted within district versus out of district and um, 
and also just other districts. So there was a comparison made about that. And then there was also um, a lot of discussion about the fact that we, the focus has been on the youngest learners of the district for a couple of years for good reason and, and how that's going to trickle up and the excitement that the group was feeling about that. But then there was also some discussion about what happens with the students that have already been in the system and are already behind and, and reading was really a big topic of conversation. So it's definitely, um, it was bringing up the fact that the, the group really wanted to understand what what the goals were for the special education department for the rest of the year and in upcoming years and a couple of the members had come and seen our the budget proposal for the special education so it brought to mind that maybe um, in January, probably not January, but February or March we might talk about having an agenda item to have um, Dr. Zielinski come in and just give a presentation to kind of give her outline of what she sees coming in the future because of the fact that now that she's been here for a little bit and has a better handle on what's been going on, um, to just give that report for the public to understand a little bit better. Sure. Um, but the, I think the focus was definitely around uh, reading deficiencies at the, not quite the middle school level, more at the Hopkins level, mm -hmm. and just how that we're obviously taking care of a lot of the, the reading issues that happened early on mm -hmm. and catching those. But for the people that didn't get that benefit, what you know, what's going to happen? Yep, that's a great suggestion, and I'll schedule that. I'll, I'll talk to Ellen um, to get that. Yeah, and we can talk more February. about more <coughs> what what that was focused on. Sure. But that that's an overview of the topics that came up. Everyone is um, very excited by Dr. Zelensky's um, enthusiasm and um, commitment to communication, and she was scheduled for an hour and was there for two hours and so like the, the that piece is is palpable with the group that wasn't there before and so um, but there are just definitely some things that they'd love to kind of dig into a little sure. bit more understandable yeah thank you thanks Lori anybody else yeah uh, I just wanted to highlight the um, coalition that the director of youth services has put to, has has started is working with the high school tomorrow night to in the athletic department to I, I think it's tomorrow night the first fifth quarter um, experience so um, the high there are two basketball games tomorrow night and then at following the basketball game the high school athletic center and cafeteria I'm looking um, will be open and students are encouraged to come there'll be music prizes food um, and so it's just working in, in partnership to create, you know, safe and sober spaces and experiences for kids and pro provide them with something fun to do. So that's a new initiative um, and a, I think a great partnership. So hopefully parents will support that and send their kids. I think it'll be a really great time. Thanks, Jean. Thanks, Jean. I don't think I'm invited. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, is it an open safe. event? Yeah. What time do the games start? Okay. Okay, so next, moving on to the chair report. Um, I just have a couple things. One is with respect to communications. I think we all, I don't know if I received more than the group, but we all received several communications encouraging an Alpine race team, which I think will be discussed and addressed later in it our will. meeting. Mm -hmm. um, we also, I also received emails with respect to requests for the budget presentations. Um, they've been addressed by Dr. McLeod and responded to. And then we've also received a communication um, with respect to the HTA contract and, and concerns that the community had there. Um, and those were also addressed by Dr. McLeod in a press release and I think directly with folks who had reached out. Mm -hmm. um, so that's it with respect to communications. Then I attended a meeting with Borrego. Yes. And um, it was a meeting that we had been asking for, and, and the town um, helped us get it in place. But basically what happened was the Borrego representative that they sent was um, a field engineer. And so even though we wanted to talk about the damage to the roof and liability and possible recovery and cost sharing, it seemed that he just was very confused and 
was he showed a picture that he had of the roof and he did it his own walk through but he certainly wasn't about to talk about any liability and he asked for um, our engineering report that Gill Associates had done which I guess we've not sent to them I, it was unclear if they had requested it before um, but it seems that now that issue is with the town and Norman was following up with Ray Miaris town council to see uh, how we should proceed um, i.e. should we send this our, our engineering report um, but my takeaway from the meeting was that we're going to get nowhere with Borrego if we don't send them <laughs> our evidence of, of some sort of damage. Um, but we'll see where that goes. And the other thing that came up was a, um, our lease with BCC and how, at least according to the Borrego representative, there was zero chance that BCC is going to just say, sure, go ahead, take the panels off while you replace the roof. And no one's looked at um, the BCC contract. And so our hands are a little bit tied there until we actually meet with a representative from BCC and talk to them about our plans to repair, not repair, um, replace mm -hmm. the roof at the high school. And so I think where we ended up was, I mean, I know where we ended up were a couple of things that um, the town, town, town manager was going to talk to town council about the engineering report and he was also going to talk to town council about the um, agreement with BCC to see what the parameters of that were and how we needed to move forward. But we can't really embark on replacing the roof until we get someone from BCC on board. And the only data point we have is that there was additional cost um, to removing panels at the fire station when they wanted to repair that roof. And so, because you have to take care of the panels once you remove them, put them somewhere, store them somewhere until it's, I don't know, repaired. I, I, I feel like I learned a lot, but also what I learned was sort of disheartening and that we have a lot of work to do before um, we can actually begin replacing the roof. So, can I ask a question? I don't know that I'll know the answer. Go for it. <laughs> Go for it. Um, do we, is the lease with us or is the lease with the town? The so we procured it, but the, the lease is with the town. Okay. So, and what's the concern on the town manager's part and sending them the engineering report? You know, I, I don't, I, I have no idea. I guess we like to, we like to check stuff with our Public town council. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I'm just I said we have the contact information. Can we just let's just send it right now? But the report. reports are even published during it. our meetings, we right? Yeah, I was say, we reviewed it in yeah, a meeting, it's, it's so it's a public document. Okay. I just was trying. To, and so obviously Borrego sent somebody that had no authority to make any decisions on anything. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. It sounds like a very useful meeting. <laughs> it, was real, it was really useful. <laughs> um, I mean, the. And this is after weeks, like. I know. Literally. Yeah. weeks of trying to get a meeting <laughs> with them so so it's I guess my only report is to say you know we, we we're still trying but we we've we've gotten the work right wow okay so that's it for the chair okay. report we'll, we'll end on that good note <laughs> I want to make an overview state oh did you want me to go on superintendent's report Thank yes you. please so uh, I make a, just a general statement about where we are with the budget before we begin tonight but just before I say that um, just you know it's holiday time and I was walking into a school today I mean clearly <coughs> it's come so quickly and with all of this rain it's just hard to even realize that we're, we're, we're upon the holidays but um, or the break um, but somebody was coming out of the middle school today and looked at me and said you know thank goodness this isn't snow and I was like what <laughs> it's <laughs> December the 16th anyway it, there's just been lots going on obviously holiday concerts and performances and celebrations and it feels you know that the climate in the buildings is very positive kids are excited there's lots of great learning going on um, and and I'm I'm constantly impressed with how that ma is maintained right up until the very last day you know it, the, the the on the on learning and there was a really exciting math um, in service that I was able to oh, yeah. Um, yeah attend 
Hopkins. At the Hopkins School, where, why don't you say a little bit about that, Bob, for us? We were lucky enough to have uh, Mahesh Sharma come in and uh, do some demo lessons for us. And um, he did it for both fourth and fifth grade with groups of about six to eight teachers. And they got to watch him um, uh, work with students to differentiate his instruction, to figure out which kids get it and don't get it in a very short time frame. He was up there uh, on stage essentially for about 40 minutes. And he was able to do that. And I think the teachers had a lot to, they took away. We had a lot of questions afterwards, and they seemed exciting to, to look for our, our next step with that uh, initiative. And there must have been 12 of us, right? Walking you were in a, you were in a big group. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. we walked in, and Mr. Kernan introduced us to the students and said, so the, the, the teachers are here to observe Mr. Sharma. They're here to watch him teach you so that it can pr improve their instruction. And it was just a great model. The kids were fabulous. After a while, you, you know, it was like we weren't even there. And actually, at one point, the teacher tried to <laughs> say something to one of the kids, and he said, this is my class now. You get them the other 179 days of the year. <laughs> so um, yep. actually, Mr. Ghosh's daughter was, was in the class, and I commented on it to him later. So just wanting to say that a lot of great professional development opportunities continue to take place. Um, up until the very day before we break. So um, tonight, as we as you um, begin to listen to the middle school and, and, and high school and athletic budgets, I wanted to update you on where we were, um, where we left off last week. And as you know, there were some last minute changes to special education. Um, I did send you these, these documents, but for the sake of the public, I wanted to say that we went back, um, met the next day um, to look at what was an additional, uh, original recommendation that we reduce um, psychologists. We had a follow-up conversation at, with Bob and, and Ralph and, and Dr. Zaleski and myself to say, you know, that, that's a, a priority. Where else can we, can we find the dollars in order to come back at close to where we were? Um, so we reduced clerical extra help. Um, that was based on a comment that you made, John around if we're increasing clerical at the Elmwood School, what about that extra help? Can't that be reduced? So we went back into that line, reduced that. We also looked at reducing what is going to be the new adjustment counselor. So this is not a current position from a 1.0 to a 0.8. This was something that Mr. Kernan agreed that if he wasn't losing his psychologist, mm -hmm. he would be able to meet the needs of the students as, as proposed in his uh, budget with a 0.8 FTE. Um, and we added the funding back in for the school psychologists, um, reduced uh, speech, speech therapists by 0.4. This was something that, based on caseload, Dr. Zaleski feels confident that she can do and has met with her speech department um, to confirm. Uh, but then the addition uh, that we told you that we didn't know the exact dollar amount that we now have is the increase to transportation to reflect accept the ACCEPT assessment that we had just received last week, um, which brings us to a budget increase that now reflects a 4.44% increase, which I think w it was 4.31? It was 4.31, yeah. So that's where we're all, we are tonight before we have the conversation about fees and before you hear from the, um, from the other schools. Any questions? That's, that's my report, but did anybody want to I wanted you to have that background before we began tonight. Nope. Thank you. Nope, thank you. So that's my report. Thank okay, you. so we're going to talk next about fee reductions with Mr. Dumas. Okay. Um, hopefully you've had an opportunity to take a look at the uh, information that I provided. Uh, we looked at all the revolving accounts which are used to offset the budget. Uh, in particular, we looked at the three fees that have been reduced by 10% annually starting in FY14, those would be transportation, parking, and athletics. Uh, and then we gave you information regarding K-6 bus, bus riders, uh, which shows the transportation fee receipts paid for those uh, students. And uh, I guess we could start off with the, uh, the balances in the revolving accounts. Excuse me, should, should we invite our appropriation guest? Sure. Oh, for the morning. fee discussion before well, it budget? Seems, it seems sure. budget related. Okay. I don't know that he has any of this information. Yeah, well, it's just even to yeah. just be yeah. part of the dis discussion. Come on up. <laughs> Is that okay? Sorry. Come. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 
Challenger <coughs> there, like We see that you got your binder, so that's yeah. great. Mr. Manning yeah. asked that we make yeah. one for I'm you, so I'm glad here. you've got it. Those are everyone doesn't know you do, you, do you mind introducing yourself? Uh, sure, my name is Shahid Manan. I'm the member of the application committee. Uh, here to listen to the budget discussions, I guess. Thank you. This will be my first time, so I'll be listening. Okay, okay. Thank you. wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So regarding uh, the analysis of the balances, uh, the first thing I want to say is that all the proposed balances comply with the school committee's policy, JJD, uh, on revolving accounts, and that the balances are, uh, you know, financially within the parameters that, that, that the committee established for each one of them. Um, so as you can see, um, I'm, I, I, at this point, I really only know what the balances were at the end of last year. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm um, estimating my receipts for FY16 and my expenses for F FY16. Therefore, my uh, balance as of June 30th of 16 is a projection. But I feel pretty confident that uh, that we're that those numbers will be close. Um, the, the FY16 expenses uh, tie to the budget uh, that was approved by the school committee last year. That's how much money you said that you would uh, use in revolving account money to offset the budget. Um, estimated receipts for bus fees, uh, th that's what we've collected so far this year. Um, some people do uh, decide to take buses later in the year, uh, but it'll change, but not by uh, an appreciable amount. Parking fees, you may see some in the second half of the year. Um, preschool tuition, that assumes that everybody that's attending now will continue to attend all year and will make all payments. Um, Athletic fees, you have the same scenario. Um, that was the number that was built into the FY16 budget for um, estimated receipts. That's made up of athletic fees and gate receipts. The F1 visa tuition, uh, the $203,000 for FY16 is what we've collected to date. We have some students who uh, were only here for the first semester. And at this point in time, I have not assumed that uh, anybody will be coming in the second half to take their place, um, just to be conservative. Um, circuit breaker, the circuit breaker is a, is a solid number unless there are state budget cuts. But that's the number that uh, uh, we've been told that we're going to receive. I think only once in all, all the time of circuit breaker have there been nine C cuts, mid-year uh, state budget cuts. Yeah. Um, that have impacted circuit breaker. So they typically stay away from that. Uh, but one time they, they did hit, hit us with that. Building use is just an estimate of uh, what we think we're going to get this year. It's higher than we assumed when we put the budget together uh, because we will be collecting more money from tech and from uh, the YMCA than we were getting from um, Kidsboro. I think it's about $15,000 more. Um, projected this year. Uh, as I said, the FY16 expenses are what, what was planned in the budget. Next year, um, those numbers are pretty much the same um, as FY16's expected receipts because we've assumed no reduction. It is down a little bit uh, in circuit breaker simply because of the, um, the fact that uh, next year's money is driven by this year's claim and we have fewer kids, uh, well, although we have more kids out, uh, the uh, big ticket items aren't as prevalent as they were before. So uh, our, if our base goes down, then our circuit breaker reimbursement goes down. The proposed commitment to the FY17 budget, all of those numbers uh, will are traceable right back into the individual program budget sheets. So uh, that gives us the balances as of June 30th of 2017. On the HPS fees history, uh, as you can see, Are we, uh, you move? oh sure. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to no, interrupt you. Maybe. Not a problem. The one question I have about parking fees, and this is just my lack of knowledge. So, assuming you're a student that can drive a car starting in September when you start school, do you pay one parking fee for the whole year, or do you pay it by semester? No, it's it's one parking fee or bus fee for the whole year. For example, let's assume that at the beginning of the year you don't have your license. Yeah. You buy a bus, a bus pass. If during the middle of the year you get your license, we just swap it out. So it's no additional charge. 
and vice versa if you had a uh, pass and something happened to your car you couldn't drive it anymore you needed to get on a bus we'd swap that for a bus pass okay thank you yep. so on the hps fees history uh, you, you see that transportation and parking fees have been the same individual fee uh, going back many years. Um, I got here in FY11 and the fees that were actual in FY13 were the same in FY11. I don't know when they were changed prior to FY11, uh, but probably uh, they were probably in place for a long time. Um, so as you can see, we have decreased those uh, by approximately 10 percent every year and it shows you how much revenue was raised as a result of those individual fees so uh, uh, again I just want to point out that and unlike transportation and parking with a gross fee uh, where the uh, the estimated or, or the revenue received you could tie back to the previous spreadsheet uh, which shows how much we expect to receive this year um, like transportation 222957 appears in both spreadsheets as does parking with athletics it's different because the, um, the HPS fees history 151,800 does not include the gate receipts you see there's that little note there please note that the athletic revenue does not include gate receipts okay so for example in FY16 we expect to take in hundred eighty seven thousand eight hundred and thirty dollars in in athletic revenue 151,800 that is the fees and the difference is the gate receipts okay so uh, the FY 17 uh, we have two estimates for FY 17 one has no fee change and one has an additional 10 percent reduction and so uh, the transportation fee if you reduced it to 140 dollars you would reduce your revenue by 21,576 <laughs> Parking, you would reduce by 4,429. Athletics, you would reduce by 13,800. Rob, can I ask a question? Sure. Just to, especially on, specifically on the athletics. Just yep. I'm trying to rationalize all the things that we have. So the 186 <coughs> is in here um, in your expected receipts. Yep. 186,750, which is also in our budget books. But I note that in my, in our athletics budget summary yeah. it says it assumes a hundred and five dollar yeah. fee whereas you're saying it's a hundred and ten so what's the hundred and eighty six it's based upon a hundred and ten it's based upon a hundred and ten yeah okay yeah. that was so I, that's only I, in the summary I would we categorize that as a typo okay, okay. <laughs> so. fair enough okay. okay all right and then uh, the last bit of information has to do with the uh, the K to six uh, bus riders so uh, there are in grades K to five, there are only 80 students who don't ride. Um, if you were to um, provide a free bus pass to the 294 students who do ride um, at $155, you would forego $45,570 in revenue. That would add about 0.116% to the budget. Uh, that would get us up to like 4.56. And then if you did grade six, oh, and uh, if I might say, uh, we do have room for those 80 students on the elementary buses, you know, because you can fit a lot more kids on an elementary bus because they can sit three across fairly comfortably. And uh, there's, there's room. So uh, we wouldn't have to do anything with additional uh, transportation expenses other than absorb the revenue, uh, the lost revenue. Uh, when it comes to grade six, a little bit different. Um, there are only 20 kids who um, who aren't riding, but there are 51 who do ride, and so that would cost you if you gave out, you know, if you waived 51 uh, paying students, that would cost you 7,905, which would add 0.020 expense. Put the whole thing together, that will get you up to 4.58 percent as your budget increase if you if you waived all those things including the 10 percent fee reduction Ralph mm -hmm. no 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 it's eliminating the fee the that, that's fee. just eliminating the k to six fee k to six right you know so the, the committee certainly could consider um, doing doing it double uh, but we'd have to do some fancy math okay. to uh, right. um, come up with what that would be 
I'm so sure, I don't know whether anybody's going to do that or not. But. Sorry, this is eliminating K through six, but keep and then and also having the bus fee for seven through twelve be one hundred. No, uh, uh, whatever. One fifty-five. One fifty-five. Right. The grades grade six, we have room for for twenty kids clearly. Um, the problem again is that. Um, whether they rode or not, you would have to have those seats available for them, which would uh, put a little bit more pressure on the high school kids, or the seven through 12 kids, uh, to find space yeah. on the buses. And does it allow for any room for um, increased enrollment? Uh, it's not really. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the whole projection, uh, you know, right. the, the enrollment projection is not an increase in enrollment. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know. It could be a bit of a house of cards, but we won't know until it actually happens. It's a lot safer, K to five. And what would the price be if you needed to add another bus? Because that's about not sixty thousand dollars per year. Per year. Yep. And the problem with doing that, Kelly, is you you, you would want to do that early. You would not want to wait until the summer or the, the September to do it. See if you've tipped. Yeah, because what would happen is you'd have a bunch of people who would have to you know re configure some routes, mm -hmm. yes, people would be moved yes, off of uh, uh, <coughs> buses and the times would change and, you know, for the, for the kids' bus pickups. Mm -hmm. So that decision would, uh, is best made early. Happy to answer any questions. Can I ask a question that's not really up for discussion or on here, just curious, when was the last time we raised our preschool tuition fee? This last year. year. This year? Last year? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did we decide, or is it just inertia that we don't have an acti student activity fee? We had a, we, we um, the school committee uh, in installed or established a student activity fee a few years ago, and I think it was projected to raise $25,000. And to be honest with you, there was a miscommunication between central office and the secondary schools, and nobody collected it. Okay. And, and the school committee uh, was made aware of that, and effectively said, we're not interested in doing that anymore. Okay. So, but based on that information, if we did institute it, that's $25,000, and that's a student activity fee from 7th through 12th? Middle and high school. Just high school. Middle. Yeah. And oh, middle and high school. Yeah. And, and the structure, if I recall correctly, was, I want to say it was $25 yes. if you were in any club. Mm -hmm. So essentially, you could be in five clubs, <coughs> and it's still $25, but if you're in one club, it was $25. Basically, if you participate in any type of activity, you pay $25. I don't remember. How would we get $25,000 at $25? That number student? sounded really there high to me when you said it. Are there a 1,000 kids? I don't think so. Uh, that's, why, that's why I said the, numbers, the number there, sounded high. I don't there remember. Are there are more than 1,000 kids yeah. just no, in high, high school, school yeah. never yeah. mind. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, that's so, right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. So the number does make sense. It's a one-time fee. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you guys, I, I have a few more, just like yeah, logistical sure. questions. The um, there's a per family maximum for buses. Mm -hmm. Is there a per family or per student or both maximum for athletics? I don't believe so. Is there a maximum for athletics, or do they keep there paying? Is not, no. We do not have a family cap. So they pay per sport. Per sport. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'd have to put, an S if you wanted us to consider that, we'd, had, we'd have to look at the participants and figure out how many families are involved and that kind of thing. Do we know, and are, or is there any, what percentage of students, if any, ask for assistance with respect to athletic fees? Yes. Assistance. Extremely low. Very, yeah. very low. Very, very few. I, I only know who qual I, I qu effectively review the applications, and they get a blanket waiver uh, for, uh, all. for all of the fees that are in, uh, established by the school committee. I don't necessarily know uh, what activities they use those for. You know, obviously, I can figure out how many of them got free busing, but uh, in terms of um, athletics or parking, I really, that, that's not something that falls under my purview, so I don't have that information.
that's it for my I mean, questions. I have, I have like thoughts on fees, but I don't know if anyone else has questions. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things if we are going to start talking about an activity fee, just because I don't think any of the rest of you have kids at the high school yet, but just so you're aware, they also pay class dues uh, that are $45 a year, which is not related to being in the drama club, but so just so you're aware what other fees are. So they pay class dues, and if they want to go to things like prom, they have to be current with their class dues for all three years, so th they do get collected. Um, and then, of course, the laptop fee. So just keep in mind if you want to add an additional fee in at the high school particularly, um, there already are those fees. But we don't have a, there's no fee for the Google Chromebooks at the middle school. No. So I don't think no. there's anything um, parallel so at the middle school. Class, class dues, class 45 dues. per class, like who sets that amount? Mr. Bishop. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. What do those pay for? Uh, yeah. we, the question is what, what does it support, the class dues? Uh, class dues goes towards senior week activities, um, prom things, the prom thing. The, the senior classes week also activities, do a lot of fundraising. Prom, prom and? Uh, other class fundraisers that are put together, uh, the prom venue, the senior boat cruise, yep. the senior picnic. But what if you're not a senior? You're saving. No, they build up all. It's like Social Security. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And, and those fees uh, are, are not subject to the wa the waiver because the school committee does not establish those fees. It, what? When you say laptop fees, is that just for you students who rent the least the laptop That's through right, the school? Which is optional, right? You can bring okay. your own, but I, I, we I, have don't, I don't remember, but yeah. I think more than... We have loaner laptops as That's well. That's right, yeah. but a high percentage just do oh, the yes. rental. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Or the least, whatever. So I, the one question I have in relation to you have the revenue number if we are to keep everything status quo as far as the fees are concerned. I could have done this math and I'm sorry I didn't do it. No <laughs> I'm trying to gauge from a budget perspective the percentage increase uh, you know like and you probably have already figured this out. You already have it? Yeah which one's the one? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out if, if you were to <coughs> eliminate like for instance the bus fee for K through six. You gave, yeah, it. You gave, you gave that one, it's point, it's point one four. Just, point ru one four. Yeah, just so roughly $40,000 as a tenth of a percent. Okay, yeah. that's yeah. So exactly that's, what, that's what I was gonna say, because the other thing is the 10% reduction right. works out to almost exactly a tenth of a percent. Perfect. $40,000 yeah. a tenth Sorry, of a This percent. is where my lack of math major and just, you know. That's why I bring the computer. Yeah, thanks. That's why okay. I bring my calculator. <laughs> <laughs> I should have for Ralph. this meeting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take any chances. You have to have that uh, okay. calculator. Do you have questions? Or I don't have questions, but I have thoughts. Okay. Kelly, do you have questions? I don't or have thoughts? any more questions, okay. though. All right. Go with it. Go with your thoughts. So, first of all, I just want to say thank you as I give my annual thank you to the analysis that you've done on the fees. Um, this has been something that has existed in the time that I've been on the school committee. Um, I don't, I'm not certainly not the only person who's who's driven this, but I, I do think that while I recognize the need for some user fees, I think that our fee structure, I think, cuts into things that fall into the category of a free and appropriate public education. Um, I think we've been doing some good things to reduce that, but I also recognize that there are some fees, including ath athletics being one of them, where I don't personally think that philosophically getting to a zero makes sense because I think that there are some costs associated with that that are natural to be paid over and above. Um, that being said, I have been on record every year as saying that the bus fee for the students who live within two miles of the school, I hate. Um, I think it's a borderline, even though we're allowed to do it under the law, I think it's a borderline discriminatory fee because it's it's unrealistic to think that these students who live within two miles can walk to their can walk to school. Um, I, I'd like to see a continued fee reduction this year, but my personal preference would be to do a targeted fee reduction, and I'd actually like to eliminate the under two mile bus fee for K through six. It costs us roughly um, fifty three thousand dollars and change 
it's a 0.14% increase in the budget. We can haggle over those numbers. Again, I know why the fee came into existence. I know why we're allowed to do it. I think as a school district and a town, it's part of our responsibility to provide children with transportation to school. And I think charging just because of the fact that they live within two miles is is wrong. And I, I was, I, when I looked at these numbers, I was actually surprised by how little it it's actually going to cost us from that perspective. So I, my proposal would be to leave the athletic fee, to, to leave all the fee levels the same, but to eliminate the charging of the fee for students who live within two miles um, K through six. So can I just, I, I have maybe then a question. When you say about 45,000 well plus the 8,000, so that puts us at We'll say fifty-five thousand with you know some, some liberal math. That means one hundred and seventy thousand is collected from seven through twelve on bus fees. One hundred and seventy by one fifty-five thousand eleven hundred riders. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I guess well I I completely yeah. agree that actually we should continue to reduce the bus fee. Given sort of Gene's comment and and my feeling that there are a lot more fees once you hit high school, it seems that then really every fee is geared towards the middle school and up. I mean, so you've offered your free education for K through six and that's it. And then it's like wham. I, I'd prefer to eliminate it across the board, but Mr. Dumas tells me that that's gonna blow up the entire busing system. I think um, buses are something we're supposed to provide. It would blow up the budget, not the busing system. Well, because well, we'd have to have a lot more buses <laughs> and they'd be half empty. And I, I, get, I mean, I get it. As I said, my pref, I, I think buses are something we're supposed to provide. I, I get the logistically the 7 to 12 would be a, a budget buster. But I guess my comment to that, Ellen, I see exactly what you're saying in terms of where they're weighted. But <laughs> even with this fee that's <coughs> for K through six at this point, it's only hitting the people that are in the two mile radius. It's not hitting the majority of people in K through six. Um, so that, I mean that that is I'm not I'm not at all diminishing your point on the fact that <coughs> when you hit grade seven fees start rolling in. Secondary education yeah. more expensive. Yeah. Right, so I guess it as is. I listen to you, John, I, it, it reminds me of the uniqueness of the community, right? So that we have these rules because we can. Um, but I know I sat here and spoke to you last winter about the uniqueness of our community in terms of you know, there were days that it felt like in some parts of the community we should absolutely be able to open school, and yet we had a responsibility to make sure that everybody could get to school. So many roads that were just not passable and not well plowed, safety issues, safety concerns for our entire district. So I think the same argument goes for students who live beyond, less than two miles away, that it is not realistic for most of them to walk to school um, because of the way our community is laid out and I often see <coughs> kids walking you know in front on along Hayden Row and even that long track down to the Hopkins school um, you, you know that that's a lengthy walk and it's great on a nice day but it's impossible on a not a nice day right so <laughs> is flavored for me by that aspect of it um, and the fact that, you know, having any child walk to center school is simply not safe. It's just not safe. There isn't a safe place to get to that school if you're a pedestrian. So, um, and I think the same argument when I think about the Elmwood school and the way that kids have to access that school and the driveways, it, it if I was a parent living less than two miles from that school, I would not let, be letting my child walk. So I think that has to factor into our decision on this issue. Um, so I'm, I'm on board, I guess, with reducing the bus fee and or eliminating K through six, but I, I do have, I mean, I think it's 
I still have this slight problem, but it becomes, it doesn't become a discriminatory issue because it's everybody who's in that age bracket. I wonder how much, um, I, I just think the reduction in athletic fees, if you look at how much we've reduced them from 13 to, to 16 and how much that's cost our budget, I don't really, so for me, the reduction in athletic fees, it just seems like that's, that's nice. I'm glad we did it, but I don't know how that compares to other districts. I do know, and I think I brought it up, I think last year I just asked why we didn't do it, that like a town, and, and I know it's not near here, but Canton High School, hockey, $475. Because you have to pay for ice, it's a very expensive sport. We have kids playing track, paying $110. And then kids playing hockey also playing $110. And so to me, there's, there's something we could be doing with the athletic fees. And maybe it's capping it for families, but maybe it's just looking at athletic fees differently because that really is not the same as getting our students to school. Could, could we let Mr. Cargill comment on that yep. because he happens yep. to be here? Could, do you mind coming up? Um, and to repeat the question, it had to do with, and I know you've, you've recently been talking about this as it relates to the ski <coughs> team and the philosophy of the district around access to sports, e equal access. Right. Um, uh, if you could just, did you hear the question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so basically, um, different schools do treat it differently. I'd say the majority of Tri-Valley League is similar to us where it's one fee or they might charge for another sport. Personally, I believe, you know, in terms of you're going to offer sports and opportunities, uh, to tell a certain kid, well, if you go to that team, it's only going to cost you X amount of dollars to, put, to play on this team. It's going to cost you more. Um, years ago, may, maybe Gene was on, uh, on the school committee, but we did, we did do a kind of a look. <laughs> sorry. Um, we did do kind of a look at what would happen, and we looked at hockey. And at the time, there's 35 ice hockey players. So you take 35 and, you know, or else you can do his calculator, but if there's, you know, an extra $200 per kid, you, you're still talking about um, not a whole lot of money that you're adding on, and also, yeah, you're talking $7,000 versus offering the opportunities for all the kids to play. Um, so, yes, obviously in, in certain sports there, there's a benefit, but, you know, all the sports, um, you know, do cost money, you know, the track teams and so on, you're, you know, they go on some long bus trips and et cetera. So yes, there's, there is a different correlation in what it costs, but in terms of back to your point, you know, in terms of, um, you know, cutting fees personally, you know, the athletic fee, if it goes down five or $10, I don't think that really has a, a, an effect on a family paying those fees unless they have, you know, multiple kids and sports and so on. So um, in terms of, but the take for us is obviously adds up to a greater amount, but I'm not really in favor of doing a structured by sport thing. Okay, thanks. Thanks. It, well, you know, it's interesting when you're thinking about the, the structure, what also kind of caught my eye is that if you were reducing fees for busing for the older grades, it would also kind of make you wonder if you should be increasing the fees for parking because you'd be wanting to encourage the use of those buses if we're going to have to expand the bus use, which if the parking's more expensive then, you know, that that somewhat leans its way that way. Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't have a good answer. I, I agree with Mr. Graziano on the fee for K through six. Um, I, I feel like it's just, it's, it doesn't make a lot of sense in our district, um, just strictly for the way that we're set up. We're, you know, we're not, our schools aren't set up like a town like Needham where they're all compact in one area and there's sidewalks everywhere and easy access to those schools. I still don't think that even the Needham parents would agree that they want their kindergartners walking to school. No. So <laughs> it's just it's just the day and the times that we're in and the comfort level of being able to have your kid walk to school has changed drastically. So And we don't have neighborhood schools. Right. Right? We're not right. organized at, in, in neighborhood schools. So uh, <coughs> at the very least, I, I think that uh, that is something that I would support this year um, in terms of reducing the other fees. Uh, I don't know that the 10% really is going to make that huge of a difference. 
but I am very cognizant of what, and I hadn't given it a lot of thought prior to Ellen saying that, you know, now we're really focusing the fees on um, the upper grades. Now, granted, the older your kids get, <laughs> the bigger the activities, the more expensive they are, and, and that, that is how it goes, and there's more things that they're in, involved in. I, you know, I, I just, I don't know if there's a way to make it equal. Did we have, do we know if we had substantially less or substantially more students playing, participating in athletics when the fee was $150 sure. as opposed to 110 I can tell you exactly. Oh, I see what you're going to do. Let's see. See the math in okay. Divided by 150, that was 1,402. Well, and the I'm thing is, you have to make a team, right? It's not like everybody, you're going to pay if you make the team. You, you Correct. Don't, you don't pay, you don't pay until after you make the team. It, so I wouldn't think you'd see much of a difference in the participation. There might be different sports offerings as we go through back in time versus yeah. now. That's the yeah. other thing. H here are the, the numbers. In FY13, it was 1,402. Then it was 1,419, 1,420. And this year's estimate is 1,380. That's how the, the budget was built. Okay. 1,380. Thank you. We'll know at the end of the year how many participants there really were. So to the point about comparable districts with with fees for the pay per sport, the non-graded 110, I'm guessing is a pretty low fee mm -hmm. from surrounding districts? Uh, that's a, a question for Eric. Oh, okay. I'm getting a head nod. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes, the answer is yes. Okay. It is a low fee. Okay. The only other question I had was around the busing because I, I am in very much in agreement with what Mr. Graziano said too. The proximity of the Elmwood School to the Lumber Street apartment complex that's being built. You had mentioned not really having a concern at the at the K to 6 level. Does the influx of potential children in that building within... Do I have a crystal ball? No, 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 but do you worry <laughs> about that kind of a proximity with a large apartment? It, would you still feel like there's wiggle room? No. So that, I just, no. I think about no. this from no right now. I, n well, not. Not if we're doing this. Not, not to absorb that many kids. Yeah. yeah. You put 80 kids on the buses that we have now. I mean, I don't know how many kids of I don't know K to 6 age yeah. are going to live there. And I don't want to do crystal ball either, but yeah. I just think, I, I think that this, in theory, I'm completely in yeah. agreement, but I think we're going to have additional buses that we're going to be having to add. Yeah. Maybe not this year, especially since we're not, if we don't say, okay, we want to do this and we want to add another bus, you know, right now. We're going to be adding buses, and if we set this precedent now, that will be the reality. In future years, we will be needing to add buses. So I think right. we just need to keep that in mind. But we also hope that we're going to have a bus parking lot that will, right, so we're going to have True. Some, True. some income some generated that can offset True. your cost of additional True. buses. I just think there's a lot to think about when True it comes to. But could there potentially be a need for an extra bus regardless of whether or not you I take think the so. fees off? That's yeah. what I was going to say. Yes. I think with the growth oh. of projected talent, we're going to be talking about it. But there's no revenue to offset well, it. Well, the, if it's the original the budget problems. request this year um, had a, an, another it bus in. It did. And oh, it did. It okay. We looked at it, and you know, we talked to Mary Ann from the transportation department, and I think I might have said this last week that we feel comfortable, even with some unexpected growth, that if people let us know by the time we're designing the routes, that we can fit them. Not every high school bus is jammed. There are a few buses that aren't as jammed, uh, but it's because of you know where the kids live that you can't maybe put so many kids on that bus because of time. But yeah, if you know yeah. early enough um, who's going to be riding, then you can tweak it a lot easier. The routes, yeah. Yeah, the schedule. Yeah. I guess my point is that if we, if we all are in agreement, I don't know if we are, we haven't talked about that, that this is the right way to go, it's not something you want to be flip-flopping on every year. You know, right. So if you've made this kind of a decision, you're kind of beholding school committee's future to kind of upholding the same decision or reversing the same decision so they'll have to come up with that on their own but 
Um, so we don't. It's just something to think about. We don't vote on this until we vote on our final budget. Right. right. We're not voting tonight. Right. But this so is what this goes is. into the budget that's being. So we're looking for direction tonight. Yeah. However, yeah. strong direction. Okay. Yeah. Because the next time we come back will be the final recommended recommended and right. So I don't know if you mm -hmm. want to hear from appropriations or. Do you guys have yeah. thoughts, or Jean? Do you? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think um, I wasn't expecting a conversation about eliminating the fee entirely for K to six. Although I do, um, I do think that that I, I, I do, I do, I do support that. Um, I think where I stand right now, you know, we started this. I mean, what you just said, Kelly, is, it really struck me because we started this in direct response to requests from town meeting um, to reduce fees and we made a commitment a few years ago that we were going to do that 10 percent a year for 10 years um, and so three or four years into it I'm loath to back off that having said that taking the giant step of eliminating the K-6 to bus fee um, entirely for the people that live within two miles it has a substantial benefit to families who many of whom also have kids in the middle and the high school. So I, I do think that that's an important step forward. I do recognize that our athletic fees are <coughs> low comparably um, when you compare to, to the region. But, you know, as you said, so that's a commitment that the school committee made. So now if we're going to flip-flop on that, then, you know, to your point, when in three years or four years we need two more buses, are they going to be, we, none of us have a crystal ball, we don't know what the financial situation of the town or the state will be at that point, um, but I think those are all important things to weigh. So I think sitting here right now, my preference would be that um, I, because you need guidance for your final budget recommendation, um, I think what I would like to see is your final budget recommendation with sort of a little asterisk saying if we eliminate the K to 6 bus fee that will take this bottom I, I would like to see it based on the 10 percent that we've been doing okay so that's, this is just me to start there then I would like to see a little bullet that says however if you reduce the K to 6 bus fee by 50 percent of what it is now it would add this much to the budget. Okay. If you reduce, if you eliminate it entirely, it would add this much to the budget. Because I think it's a little hard right now. We still have presentations to go through. The accept money went up. So we're not really sure where we're going to end up. If we're starting to creep up into 5 6%, obviously we can't do that. So okay. that's what I would, if that's comfortable, that's what I would like to see. I would like to say at a baseline, I'd like to see the 10% reduction across the board and then from there I'd like to see what the additional impact of those other two Before options would be. So in transportation and athletics? Athletics. Okay. Can I ask so, Jean one question though based on the fact that I was not here nor at that town meeting where that was request was made. several town meetings. Um, yeah. yeah I'm sure it was before I lived in town. <laughs> yeah, no. um, I'm just trying to understand was the the ask of the town at the time was to completely eliminate fees or was it just to see a reduction because I guess my question about that is is that you know we all experience in our in our daily lives and expenses of our daily lives that as time goes on things get more expensive mm -hmm. and to hear that our fees generally speaking in the surrounding towns are reasonable or quite low um, and I and I get that reasonable is subjective based on income, but uh, in comparison to other towns. So what I'm trying to understand is what is the goal to get to zero, or is the goal to get to more reasonable? When we made that decision a couple of years ago, the goal was to get to the to zero. That doesn't mean it can't change. With I mean, you know. No, no, I get that. I'm just so, trying to understand what the thought process is. Yeah, and that's then. all I'm trying to do is just sort of provide the context. And, and again, we, we are faced with different um, data points than we were at that time, and, and we have to do what we think is right for this budget. And at the time, we still had full-day K fees, which we've completely eliminated. Um, you know, so I, we have definitely made great strides forward in reducing and to answer your question, was there a specific 
detailed request of how, no. It was just a general, you know, this is public education and we're paying a lot of money for it outside of our taxes. And so, um, so I do overall think that we have been very responsible in responding to that request. I just want to make sure that we continue to honor that the request was made when we're considering it. And we only go back to FY13 here, but if, to my recollection from when I was, before I was on the committee and when I first got on the committee, is these were all, these also went up. These were also going up. Right. They the did go before up. Before we started to, because I think that was and the tipping point And that's year. what started the conversation. Yeah, was that they kept going up. Um, I, I, I mean, I, again, I do agree, I mean, been, uh, the other person who was on the committee when, when this fee reduction effort started, um, that the goal was, again, that whole idea of what are the things that we should provide as part of a free public education and why are we charging for them. I, I, I do think, and while I recognize that we, we have to be cognizant of the impact on the various levels of school, while we've been doing the 10% per year reduction, we've also, to, as you pointed out, we took a really big step with respect to saying that full-day kindergarten is part of what we expect in a public education right. and we're not going to charge for that. And so I, I feel like this is a similar step, um, which is why, and, and again, I, it's, it's the fee that I just personally feel is the most disparately applied to the community and, the, and therefore the one that's the hardest to justify. No, so, I, I don't yeah. disagree with you at all. I just want to see the whole picture. And yep, absolutely. That's all. Kelly, do you have any more comments on the budget before I throw it to our guests? Oh, no, I already gave mine. Okay. Um, so I I just want to say in response to, I guess, Jean's comment and John's that, and, and I th actually think I said this last year, That's not that was not a commitment that I made as someone on the school committee. And I, I do, I believe that transportation should be reduced. I just don't think that it should be a blanket. Every fee should get reduced by 10%. I mean, at the time the commitment was made, which was at least as early as FY14, but I, I think it was done in FY13 um, when you were dealing with FY14 budget, the fees were up at 210, 210, and 150. Now we're down at 155, 155, and 110. And so they have been substantially reduced in addition to the, the full day kindergarten. Um, and I, I mean, I, I think the goal to, to get to zero or, and I, I, do, I do recall when, um, I can't remember, we had someone else on the committee, I can't remember his name, it's terrible. Oh, um, Scott. Um, Scott. 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 Oh, Troy. <laughs> Sorry. He really did feel that the initiative was to get down to zero, and it was not just 10% off this number, he felt it was 10% off the 210 number every year, so every year it should go down, not 10% of 155, but 10% of the original number, which was 210. So I, I know there's been a lot of conversation about <laughs> what that original commitment was versus, you know, what are we doing and are we ever going to reduce them enough? Um, but I do think we have to think about it with respect to the education that we're providing and um, how it's going to affect our total budget. Um, so to the extent we're putting together, like, variations on um, what the budget would look like, mm -hmm. I actually would, I want to see a variation where where it's different, where transportation goes, you eliminate it for K through six, stays the same, or goes down 10% for, yep. and so at that point, I mean, I don't know if I should just have that discussion, you know, we should all get what we want for information and bring that ourselves, it's really gonna belong on a chart, but. Um, okay. I understand. Okay. Do you guys have comments, appropriations, or Mr. Mosher? Well, uh, Having lived through this for the past 10 years, whatever, with the fees, I, uh, the bus fees by far are the ones I like the least because you, you had to do it. You really had no, no choice. <laughs> uh, but I also recall going back to 2010 or even, I think it was even before that, when you started having the fees, that it was really about providing core services mm -hmm. or having the fees that, that you didn't have to cut or you allowed you to increase the core educational services. So I'd like to, with those comments, I'd like to say that it's really about the big picture, about the budget. We owe it to stay within the big picture of uh, what the Board of Selectmen recommended, which was uh, level funded plus contractual agreements, and then you work from there. And, um, but basically, you have to look at the big picture. I'd love to, everyone would love to have, not to have to pay these fees for, for busing, but at the core of, at the cost of the core education, and that, that's been the decision for the past 10 years on it. And so I'm not going to make any comment. Um, 
position on that in terms of the sports, especially high school sports, and I think the level of Hopkinton sports, the way they are compared to the rest of the state. Um, I do think that the cost of the, the fees is minimal compared to, I don't know how many kids on a varsity, who make it to a varsity sport or even JV sports, the club sports, and the $110, whatever, is, is nothing compared to the cost of uh, athlet, you know, doing athletics at that, at that level. Um, yes, it should be free to all, but it really it's not, I'm not going to say it's not fair, but those who really want to do it is a choice to, to excel at that level. And, um, and people understand that going in, and I think that's why you don't see a big difference in the level of participation in the sports, I think, because compared to what it, the effort required, it's, parents think that's worth it. Do you have any comments? Uh, yeah, just in general, I think uh, certainly it's a very reasonable thought that uh, the transportation fees uh, within the two miles uh, ideally could be eliminated and uh, or reduced. I think it, it makes sense from that perspective, but at the same time, uh, being new, I don't know much of the history, but uh, we do need to look at the bigger picture. And of course, budget means you have limited resources and based on your priorities, you want to optimize that, of course. So my only comment is that do we have the full picture and uh, based on all the priorities that you have, how would you rank it and put it into the buckets? Uh, so, and, and the other point I wanted to make is that uh, based on the scenarios, I think it would be helpful if we could see some of the scenarios and how it impacts the budgets short term as well as the long term. I like the comment that it wouldn't be for a short term, right? And you have a, a long term goal in mind and ultimately going to zero eventually if that is the goal. How does it look and how can it be done? And based on your priorities, where does it stand? I think that would be good information to look at for making such decisions. Great conversation, very thoughtful conversation. I think that, uh, you know, 10% off. $110 fee. I think, well, the, in, the intent is is um, is probably the point that the original conversation was around. I think to do something meaningful, I think that uh, eliminating the K-6 totally makes sense. I think that's, that's a community issue that goes beyond just 10% off an athletic fee. I think that really achieves something for the town. It's probably something that's long overdue. I understand it's a little more money. Um, hopefully my colleagues will agree. Uh, but I, I think it's um, I think it's a very meaningful step to take. Uh, I think it would be a good first step to take. And in the, mean, in the meantime, you could consider the other aspects of transportation between now and the time we're going to get that big windfall okay. from the parking, parking. Oh, the oh, bus yeah. parking. parking. I, I thought you meant legacy farms. <laughs> <laughs> no. That can be interpreted. Uh, it's not a big windfall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I personally, my family won't benefit. Uh, directly, I do think it, it makes a lot of sense for, for the community at this point. Thank you. Can I, can I yeah. So, um, not necessarily in direct response to, but 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 the both members of the Appropriations Committee sort of reminded me of a, a point that I, I think I make every year. But um, when we talk about the, the cost in the big picture, I think one of the things that's important to remember is that this sort of becomes a municipal accounting exercise. Mm -hmm. So we know what the buses cost, and it's a question of are we going to spread that cost over the taxpayers or are we going to fixate it onto a, a few users? Mm -hmm. And so while if we leave the fee in, it doesn't ostensibly show up in the budget and the budget increase, we haven't actually affected services and we haven't actually affected what the cost is. We've just taken mm -hmm. the source of that revenue and driven it towards the two mile radius of each school. And so while with athletics, it's more of a user fee, and I can understand that, which is to say we're putting the, we're putting the revenue on those users. They are the ones who are, who are choosing to try out for and play the sport. It, doing that because people happen to live within two miles of the school, it feels like we're sort of taking advantage of an accounting trick to be able to, to drive the cost to them and take it off of the, the tax revenue books. And so that's sort of another reason why I feel very strongly about that one because it, it doesn't it doesn't feel like a user fee. It feels like a penalty for where you choose chose to buy your house or where we chose to build the school. 
And it changes each year. <laughs> right? Yeah, every two years. So. All right. Okay. Thank you. Do you have enough? I do. Okay. Thank you very much. So now, should we call up Mr. Keller for the middle school budget presentation? We should. Do we have room by Ralph? Bye, Ralph. <laughs> Yeah. This is like the most crowded meeting I think we've ever had. I know. We need another table. Yeah, seriously. Just for him to move his stuff, that would be. Mr. Keller, <laughs> thank you for being here. Um, as with all of our principals, as, as the school committee knows, uh, we've already gone back and, and asked Mr. Keller to dig a little bit deeper. And um, what, you, what he's going to review tonight are his priorities um, for the budget for FY17. Thank you. Um, so I uh, appreciate the opportunity to present with, to you my budget. And as you saw, hopefully, in the executive summary, uh, enrollment for uh, next year uh, at the middle school is, is projected at 863 students. That's an increase of 15 students from the current year. Um, and ultimately, that will work out to uh, average class sizes and academic classes in grade 6 of 24 per class, in grade 7 of 22 per class, and then in grade 8 of 23 per class. Um, one of the things I worked hard on, as Dr. McLeod had mentioned, uh, is to make sure that we were uh, presenting a fiscally responsible budget. So uh, in terms of personnel, my only request is for a reading coach. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The reading coach, the goal of the reading coach would be working with teachers to improve the academic literacy in, the, in those teachers' specific content areas. They would provide leadership in our school around literacy programs and practices and would also be working on uh, short-term and long-term professional development with our staff. Um, and I took a similar approach in terms of expenses in um, trying to meet uh, the demand for a level service budget. As I mentioned in the executive summary, uh, 22 of the 27 middle school supply and textbook accounts are at or below the levels in the FY16 budget. Um, the five that are above are uh, under $500, and then I had two that were above $500. The first one is social studies textbooks, and that's a $2,400 increase, uh, and that's to meet uh, the grade eight enrollment. So next year, uh, is our, the, the, the bubble class uh, will be in eighth grade, and they're projected to be at 316 students next year. And then uh, the other item, uh, or the other uh, account, is to increase music supplies by $551 for, uh, head, for a purchase of headphones. Um, what you are not finding in the budget in terms of a personnel request would be uh, foreign language, and that's something that we uh, spent a significant amount of time uh, discussing, and uh, with the, um, uh, certainly with the desire to have foreign language in grade six, um, but in, in looking at the level service budget, uh, ultimately that was a request for uh, three teachers and, and, uh, and the materials, and um, we're having a difficult time um, meeting a level service budget with that. Uh, moving forward on that. So, do, do you want to ask questions first about, or would you like some additional uh, background about the foreign language um, and the work that we've done on on looking really carefully at that piece of things? Like, how would you like to do this? Does anyone have questions on the foreign language? It, yeah, I would like to hear okay. that. Okay. So, um, Bob and I are going to try to share this yeah. mic. All right. Um, so uh, the, a committee was formed. Mr. Yes, Burla yes. formed a, a committee, and we've actually been preparing and working with that committee to prepare a response to families following tonight's meeting um, regarding all the things that were taken into consideration in making this recommendation because we did not want it to be a sixth grade decision. We felt that the recommendation around increasing world language should be a K-6 decision, long-term decision, and taking into consideration other things that we're going to need to be looking at next year. So Bob, do you want to provide yeah, some we, of the... Yeah, we uh, um, want to thank the community. We, uh, they gave us a lot of input uh, in terms of what their preferences were, both in terms of uh, language expansion in the middle school as well as in the elementary school. We looked at all their survey results, and from that, uh, in as well as examining the budget, we came up with uh, a few things we wanted to update you on. We're aware that the community wants to see uh, increased proficiency levels in the high school. When kids come out of the high school, they want students to be at that uh, intermediate proficient level. Um, we acknowledge that. Um, in examining implementing the f world language program in the elementary schools and in grade six, we had some other um, 
priorities that we had to examine as well. One of those priorities is the fact that uh, we want to make sure that students are on grade level and at a reading at an appropriate level in the school and at the grade level that they are. We have a, several schools that are in level two and our goal is to, to work to, to make that not true, to have all schools be level one. The second thing is the implementation of the new science standards. We acknowledge that there's a limited amount of time in the day and there's a limited amount of time that teachers have available in order to be trained. So for us, that is the number one priority, is to, is to look at those new science standards. At the elementary level. At, at the elementary level. Mm -hmm. In examining those, as well as keeping in mind the, uh, the budget impacts, uh, at this time we're not recommending that we move towards expanding the world language program. This doesn't mean that it wouldn't show up as we re-examine our strategic plan and look at the next generation of that. It's not to say anything, it just means in the current iteration of the plan and the footprint that it has in terms of years, this is something that we feel is not the top priority. It still is a priority, but not the top priority. The dollar, the dollar sign for just sixth grade would have been $200,000. That would be two, for the two teachers and additional materials. And that's only sixth grade. The reality that we examined with our team, and we had representation from, from two elementary, a principal and, a, and, a, and Meredith, was in order to truly increase proficiency, which is what the discussion was about, yep. it would require 90 minutes of instruction per week at the elementary level. So the conversation quickly became, where do we find that 90 minutes? Yep. How do we provide that instruction at the elementary level? What is that going to mean for time on learning? around ELA and math, for example, um, and then how many teachers will it take to provide that each year as we increase the footprint of, of world language? Um, and given the priorities that Bob just listed, mm -hmm. we're faced with having to make a decision and a recommendation to the community on where we are right now, and I would say for the length of the current strategic plan. Um, I know that before I got here, for the two or three years prior, it constantly came back, year after year after year, the conversation about world language. And this committee really wanted to take a look at this as a long-term recommendation that perhaps needs to wait until the next strategic plan, rather than raising this every single year. <coughs> but the other really important discussion that we had, yes. and that Marilyn Miracle um, really brought to the forefront, was increasing proficiency means how many minutes? 180 additional there was something in here about the yep, number of minutes while you look for it. We started to think, to talk about, well, we can increase proficiency by having students participate in four years, four consecutive years of, of a foreign language. Um, beyond, so we, they already have seventh and eighth grade. That's, that's everybody gets it in seventh and eighth grade. But how do we increase students staying with it so that through high school they can have that, those consecutive years that will result in at least intermediate level proficiency. So in, a, in other words, we're almost flipping it. Rather than looking at introducing world language at an earlier grade, we're looking at uh, having students uh, use consecutive with grades within that secondary grade levels and stay with it. So those were the extra minutes. We're committed to promoting s more students coming out of high school with that uh, intermediate proficiency, and we're looking at doing that within the existing structure. So with working with Maryland, our plan is to how do we encourage students to stay in there? How do we promote the program more, the different languages? How do we uh, convince students that uh, two years isn't enough? You really want to stay with it for, for more than two years? And working in that direction. So th in that short term, even though it's not, a pro it's not a top priority in the existing strategic plan, we still want to make progress towards this goal. So that's how we're looking mm -hmm. to attack it, which wouldn't have a <clears throat> necessarily a budget impact. Um, I just, well, I had some comments and, and one question. Overall, some of it ties into the foreign language discussion, but an overall discussion um, that Mr. Keller just presented. Is that fine? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, the one question I wanted to ask Mr. Keller was with the reading coach, um, is that in direct correlation to the needs of the grade six that you anticipate coming in from Hopkins? Um, um, it's not, I mean, it, it's actually something that we're seeing um, more and more. And so we're, we're actually seeing it in the building six through eight. Uh, it's, it's, 
Um, some of the work that uh, our school and Hopkins and the elementary schools have done around reading are uh, identifying or helping us identify kids who are have these greater uh, needs that we feel like need to be addressed in all subjects as opposed to um, constantly going to a, a reading intervention. So we're looking at have the, the reading coach, the goal of the reading coach would be to take a, um, to help increase the literacy uh, knowledge for all, all teachers um, and, and working with the math, science, English, and social studies teachers and increasing their knowledge to working with them. So it's not so much the kids that are coming to us, although that partially is, but we, there are kids in the building that we feel strongly would benefit from uh, having this reading coach working in their classrooms. The 2011 uh, frameworks requires, and this is something new, requires embedded literacy across the content area. So literacy uh, standards that need to be met through social studies, through science, um, and so we see challenges across the content areas for, for um, um, helping kids to access literacy within those areas that previously had not been an expectation. So if I'm a social studies teacher or a science teacher, I don't know very much about teaching reading right. skills. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I, I absolutely see, uh, see the need, especially, I mean, based on how the standardized testing is focusing more on, even with your math problems, becoming more word problems and reading an entire yep. paragraph and then the math being embedded in there having a math teacher who doesn't have that expertise, I, I see the need for it. I just also was trying to figure out if our population was also requiring it, but it sounds like it's a joint effort. But what I wanted to tie it back to with the foreign language discussion is mm -hmm. that I, I actually ap applaud the committee's decision making on it because of the fact that it, we're seeing with our student population <laughs> the reading deficiencies. Adding another language in there isn't going to necessarily assist that problem um, until you not if we struggle to find time on learning no right? and and so I feel like you know where where we're seeing struggles with ELA currently in wanting to increase our proficiency there within our buildings I, I think that the additional foreign language piece it just makes those time constraints even harder. So the reality is that often students who, who struggle with literacy or ju just struggle in general receive additional instruction during foreign language block. So they don't even get the instruction. Right. That's how in we the meet the school, needs yes. at the middle school level. Yes. Well, in uh, grade seven and eight. Right. Okay. So that's a, a place where we can pull students for additional instruction um, and they're not having access to foreign language because of that very reason. Um, so yes, uh, to take away 90 minutes a week of instruction at the elementary level and worrying about, you know, as I always talk about prevention, making sure that our kids get to third and fourth and move on and, and come into the middle school proficient um, goes against what we, we feel is a priority right now. Um, the other question I have, and this is just my lack of memory <laughs> is our uh, students per class similar to last year? Uh, the yes. ratios, I'm sorry, I'm not, art I'm not articulating very well. Yes, this one form one a. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, we're, we we're flipping read, around. We can so. read those to you right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's currently 21.8. Okay. Next year it will be 23.6. Oh, okay. Grade 7, 21.9, and next year 22. Grade 8, 23.3, next year 22.6. Perfect. Thanks. Do you have comments, questions? I, Lori covered. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's good. I, I don't need to be redundant. It was the same thing around reading coach. I, I see a big need for that, so I... I Donna Jean, do you have any comments I, or questions? I mean, I, again, I think actually Lori summed up a lot of mine too. I, this is, you know, we, we talk a lot about trade-offs and we don't often get to illustrate it in these meetings. And I know that these, this is a, a difficult decision. The expansion of that foreign language program in a vacuum is something that I think we would all favor. Um, but the logistics of the time, the funds necessary versus what we want to spend them on, I would much rather be focused on a literacy coach than focused on putting foreign language in the sixth grade. The, these, this is a priority item for our for our district right now. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, I, I guess, I, you know, 
I'm trying to process what sounds like kind of a reversal from the presentation that we had earlier in the year mm -hmm. um, about foreign language, and I know that's not really the topic at hand, so I don't want to really start down that path. Um, I certainly agree with the need for the reading coach, and um, you know, uh, um, and given the way that the budget is going and the conversation around fees and everything else, I also understand that we can't afford foreign language. I don't even know if actually you have three more classrooms in this building with all those kids and 316 no. kids in a class. And I mean, they'd have to travel. So, it, right, know, it's, so. It, it's a, lot of, a lot of compromises and a lot of logistics. I just, um, I'm just discouraged because it's, you know, it's a, a goal we've been working towards and had so many steps forward, giant steps back, and it just feels like another one. So it just, um, but again, that's a, that's a separate topic for a different day. So I don't have any other questions about the middle school budget, and I, I certainly agree with the need for the reading coach. So is a reading coach the same as the literacy coach? Mm -hmm. And right now, well, when we had the Center and Elmwood, mm -hmm. they're sharing one Correct. for same, four grades. Same, same Hopkins role. did not ask for one. Mm -hmm. And now this is the same role for all three grades in the middle school. Mm -hmm. And we approved a liter literacy coach or reading coach last year. Mm -hmm. But when we say that this is a new FTE, is that because that was... It moved into it, a different program. Okay. It, Kate left special, special education. It was a K-8 position. Okay. Um, one of the reasons we never filled it was that it was very difficult to find someone who had expertise at all of those levels. Um, so it, it is now funding a curriculum position, but will come from the SPED program over to the middle school program. So it's... It's, uh, it's new to this cost center. It is new to this cost center. So it's, it's not necessarily going to be new to the overall budget. Okay. All right. And is there a reason why, at least at the time, we thought one person, so one FTE could cover eight grades, and now we think? No, it was budget. It was budget driven. We were we were having to make do. So is this a better model? Absolutely. <coughs> but as always, we are faced with having to make difficult decisions based on priorities. So. You know, as we all agreed when we presented the last time, Gene, around foreign language, it was a great and wonderful thing until we saw what it was going to cost mm -hmm. and until we got to pulling all of the requests together at what we feel is a really tight budget and even within that where there isn't anywhere else to go, yeah, no, I get it. there just wasn't a way to, bring, to, to be able to afford it. So um, it was the same thing with the reading coach recommendation last year. We were recommending based on what we were trying to work within. So it's, I guess, is there a reason why we don't need someone at Hopkins and or are we thinking? It would be wonderful to have someone at Hopkins. But that's a budget, that was it just It was made basically from a asking decision. Mr. Kernan to make priority recommendations okay. and, and he absolutely, he the adjustment counselor okay. was, you know, the, the significant behaviors and the needs in his building. Now, does that mean that we can't share our well, resources? Not at all, of course we can. Um, and we will as we work through the year and caseloads change and needs change and we can provide professional development opportunities across the district that use the talents of our two reading coaches, we absolutely will be doing that. So I think that's probably where I was going to end up going. Yeah. So to the extent this person's offering professional development, it's not necessarily going to exclude Hopkins uh, no. or Hopkins. No, but they will be building base they will build positions base. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, that will be if, if definitely there is um, a consult that's needed or a professional development that's happening after school or on an early release day, Hopkins teachers would absolutely be, th those resources would be available to them. I should though also um, state that there currently is not a reading specialist at the middle school, correct? <coughs> and there used to be. And so this model is changing in terms of having students who are struggling going to a special teacher who's going to help them. You know, because I've talked about this multiple times, about the difference between that model and a reading coach model that Alan has described really well. Um, so he used to have that and he lost it over, the, over time. At the Hopkins School, 
there is a reading specialist still in the budget as there are in all of the elementary buildings. So someone who can help students who have really need those directed services is still part of um, Tim's budget. So and this is my last comment on a literacy coach and I do think I asked this last year too and I just can't remember the answer. This is if all went really well, this is not a position that you would need in six years necessarily. I mean, I think, um, so ultimately the goal is that this person is working with the teachers and giving them the skills that, um, that they need. This is, yeah, so yes, I guess if, if, if all goes well, this is, the things that this person is teaching them is now integrated as a regular okay. part of their classroom. Well, and uh, at, on the other side of that, is that we're hoping to send kids better prepared so that there'll be fewer kids that need reading services and are ready to access the grade level curriculum. Right now we've got this gap um, and you know it, as I've said it's going to take several years to, to, to close that gap but working from both ends with the additional support and then providing the this support at the middle school level I just think is so important um, that over hopefully less than six years, we'll see a significant yep. reduction in kids okay. who have reading needs. All right, appropriations or Mr. Mosier? No, I, I <coughs> Sounds like a very <coughs> thoughtful budget that you've gone through. Um, I just wonder in general, uh, Ellen, you made a comment about uh, word problems in math. The oh, oh, I'm sorry. Laura, <laughs> That's I guess right. it was you. Is is there um, any change in in the competency of students reading? As do you think in general, has technology affected that at all, or is this just something needs to that you had before that needs to be replaced? Um, I don't. I'm not sure that I would. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure um, if I would say I've observed a, a, a change in their competency in reading. I, I, I certainly. I mean, this is something that I. What I ultimately think is that. Um, we are, you know, as Dr. McLeod mentioned earlier with um, the Common Core, um, our focus, you know, I think traditionally we've looked at English as a place where kids are reading and writing, and the Common Core, rightfully so, is saying that kids need to be reading and writing all day long in all their classes. Um, and so um, what we're trying to do is increase their reading and writing skills um, all day long, so it's not just in that one individual classroom. Um, and if I could add, what I'd say that has changed is <coughs> what students are being asked to do in these high stakes testing environment, and now it's much more dependent on me being able to interpret what, what the words say, and not, it's not just in a single thing, it's being able to in interpret it from multiple sources and being able to come to some conclusion based on what I'm reading and inferring from that. Well, they're so, trying to trick you at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and it's also being done on a machine, on a computer now. So that's what's different, is I'm expected to be able to grasp what's on here, to read, to think, and then being able to output my answer on this device. So that's what's changed as well. So literacy is changing, and that's why, Ellen, I'd be a little he hesitant to say, oh, is it just going to be encapsulated within six years? Hopefully, but maybe not. Maybe there's going to be bigger challenges that surface when I have to output my thoughts and processes on this device, and it's part of this testing environment, and that's cap encapsulating how I think. So mm -hmm. we might need different sorts of support. So uh, that's what we see is changing now, and you're absolutely right in asking that question. It, it's more critical now than it ever has been that I'm able not only to read, but to understand what's in there, and then be able to problem solve based on what I've, I've read. So that's the big challenge we're faced with. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I think uh, you all articulated very well the kind of not, not just the um, monetary investment for foreign language, but also it would take away from, from something you're, at the same time you're trying to shore up this issue would be counterproductive as much as we'd like to have it. I just have one quick question when I saw um, under items uh, three and four, effective instruction, use of student assessment results, and item four, student assessment using learning data to plan and adjust instruction. There's that position that we talked about at the, at the last meeting that I was at, not the one Brian Hurt was at, so it would have been two meetings ago. Um, I think it was a data analyst or something like that. That That's what that position would help do, right, is, is these two things? Mm 
-hmm. Okay, I just wanted to understand the application. That's going to be yeah. available for all the for all the schools. That position would be yes. Yeah. So three and four. Um, exactly. So there's a tremendous amount of work going on with our teachers and our administration, r really looking carefully at assessment and way beyond MCAS day to day <coughs> assessments and looking at assessment results. So when we say establishing high expectations, really being able to understand for all kids, you know, if you're not progressing, we expect you to be able to prog progress. And if you're not, you know, what, what can we be doing differently? Um, the missing link is, so there's this data, there's a tremendous amount of data, having somebody who can help organize, analyze, and then um, work with the teachers to develop intervention plans, instructional intervention plans, because the teachers are the experts and we know that. Um, but they having that time to be able to analyze at that level and then provide the report that they need mm -hmm. to then come up with an instructional plan is what that individual will be able to do. So you're right in remembering that and, and how that's related to these two strategic goals. And this extra coach, this I shouldn't say extra, this coach would then help execute part, right. part of that plan. Absolutely, really because great. they'll have the instructional intervention expertise to be able to tie it to looking at data around reading achievement, for example, and being able to look at the data and understand clearly what's missing in that student's instructional profile um, that can then be provided. Okay, thanks. Thank yeah, you. We're, we're just, um, you know, we're we, we, at our November professional development meeting, we, uh, we talked a lot about uh, assessment and data, and that was the, the focus of that meeting, and we, we talked about the acronym DRIP, and we're, we're very, we're data rich but information poor, and that's... <laughs> Um, uh -huh. And that's that's what we're looking to these people to help us with, and and so we have those little snippets of helping teachers who have all kinds of data. And as to Dr. McLeod's point, uh, it's not just the MCAS, but helping us draw conclusions from just the, the quick formative mm -hmm. ten-minute assessment that we gave last week, and helping identify patterns and how can we share that information. Great! It sounds like Correct. kind of a whole new. I don't like the acronym. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's better than drop, right? <laughs> um, but, but it does sound like a whole a bit of a whole new evolution for for the way you can execute such a targeted way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are we good? Did you well, have another question? Yeah. I, I like what I saw, a nice presentation. I did have a question just about the eighth grade enrollment and the projection that that's a big increase. That's, that was always the large class that we're following year over yeah. year. Um, what what ex explanation is that there's five, you're projecting nine extra students? I know it's the last couple of years before that same seventh to eighth grade. I would have thought maybe the high school it jumps or a different grade. Why why seventh to eighth? You can answer. <laughs> it's just the Nasdaq. It's, it's, yeah, it's just the Nasdaq, Nasdaq right? Yeah. 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 Our our enrollment uh, projections come from uh, Nasdaq, the New England School That's Enrollment uh, Council. They're the guys that do this every year. They work with. Uh, uh, the people at UMass Amherst, they're in communication uh, with uh, uh, folks in uh, land use uh, over at Town Hall. And, you know, they feed data into a, uh, into a, a formula, probably, and that's uh, where these numbers come from. And we found that uh, last year, October 1, uh, w when they projected for this October 1, they really weren't that far off. Uh, kindergarten is where there were some minor differences, uh, as you would expect, uh, but all the other grade levels were fairly, you know, pretty much right on. So uh, those are the well, numbers we've been using for years. Yeah, just because just the FYI, one. seven to eight last year, that cohort went up by eight students. Yep. So the the eighth grade class this year was was eight students less in seventh grade. So I, it's probably just based on some averages that some they use. grades just go up two students and all yep. of a sudden this yeah. one's nine, but last year seventh to eighth was also nine. And, I know. and it's just I was it's magic, Mike. <laughs> I guess it is. <laughs> all right, thank you. <laughs> I thought it, this was great, uh, uh, thought wise and very thoughtful too, of course. A uh, quick question on I heard um, uh, if I understood correctly the there's gap in the reading assessment in the elementary level? Reading achievement. Reading achievement. Mm -hmm. uh, is it a quantifiable gap? Do you have oh, yes. data? Yeah, we do. So in terms of the percentage of kids who are not where they need to be at grade level, um, we absolutely have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and um, so that sounds like a great program to improve that. And with that, do you have any target in mind that could move it up, uh, move up the needle, so to speak? So do you mean the target of numbers of students who are not struggling with reading? Right, yeah, or right. gradually, how do you 
improve and eventually you know get to a better state right state. so definitely that's why we implemented full day kindergarten so one right to have a really very strong start for all kids where they're getting the same curriculum every single child which was not what we had in place in the town and then moving them forward already consistently into first grade where the kids have already had a more common experience and we've already had the full day to be able to work with them students who were only there for half a day and who were struggling we we weren't able to really early provide the additional interventions that they needed we're doing this at every grade level um, we call it double dipping it's kind of not like drip though but it's it's double dip so we want to provide the regular curriculum but then we want to also provide additional instruction for students so that we can close the gap and we know that it's so much easier to do it if we get them at the beginning so if that gap is is six months it's a whole lot easier to close that gap that in, than if it's two years and so getting them early providing that really strong intervention at the early grades and then working at the as you've heard at the second and third grade level to provide a reading coach to work with with the teachers those are all ways that we're looking to reduce that gap um, we're already seeing some great results from those efforts but the other piece we look at is decreasing the numbers of students on IEP so when we were the special education director was here last week and and we used the comparison of the state average percent number that we are you know consistent with the state average um, that's not good enough because 13 percent of numbers of students on an IEP we should be way below that when you talk about target so I would boldly say that the target should be closer to nine um, and again getting at it the same kinds of ways because that gap is so much easier to close plus if we do that work well there's fewer students needing special special education services by the time they reach fourth and fifth grade. And what's hidden, and, and Kathy, uh, that's fine, I'll just lean over. And what's <laughs> hidden in this whole thing is our battery of <laughs> assessments that we use. We've upgraded those, we've expanded those, so we get more detailed information now. Mm -hmm. We get more complete information at multiple points throughout the entire year. So that's what's also changed. That's something that sits below the level that Kathy talked out, but that's the foundation. Without that, we can't. De determine if we're making uh, adequate progress or not. That's so. right. Yep. If I can just piggyback, you, a, a couple weeks ago we had a great presentation about the MCAS, so you might want to just go back and watch, and that will probably give you a, a more, more baseline understanding. Yeah. And, and just as we go through these, you'll see that's why we have all of the, um, w why we've asked them to tie their budget presentations to different points in our strategic plan, which would be another great resource too, just so you can see where we're trying to go, because I think you'll, you'll, you're hearing, you'll start to hear sure. consistent themes across all of these departments sure. and where they're trying to get to. Great, thanks. So it might be yeah. good background. <laughs> of education. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Big question. So I think we're, re are, are we ready for the high school budget presentation? Thank thanks, you. Mr. Thank Keller. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll start with you, and then maybe you can stay while Eric yeah, comes up. Sure. Thanks. I like these one-page summaries. Too yeah. 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 Cut to the chase. Yeah. And I caught the background. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Bishop, thank <laughs> you for being here. Thank you for being here so late. I know what time your day starts. Um, so appreciate you being here, um, and I'll just turn it over to you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me and uh, allowing me the opportunity to talk on behalf of the high school and our plans for the FY17 budget. I believe you've had the opportunity to take a look at the executive uh, summary, so I'll just talk about some highlights and then answer any questions that you may have. Uh, just some background information. I, I started conducting budget meetings with the high school subject matter leaders, or SMLs as we call them, uh, as early as uh, the beginning of October, and I've met with many of them multiple times as we've had to make some difficult uh, yet appropriate cuts as I acknowledge that we are a good sized district. Uh, we are together as a system on this and it's not certainly a financial climate that we could ask for anything and expect to get it. So we've had some difficult conversations. Uh, I think we've been thoughtful. I think we've been reasonable in paring things down and trying to focus on what is truly needed uh, to, to continue to, to provide the level of service to our high school students and keeping in mind the strategic plan as well as our school improvement goals. Um, I do just want to also say thank you to Dr. McLeod, Mr. Brillo, and, and Mr. Dumas, and the SMLs for their help, support, and hard work with coming up with this budget because I feel like it is really responsible when it comes to personnel and our non-payroll uh, accounts. So let me first start with personnel, uh, which includes an increase of 0.6 FTE uh, to offset our subject matter leaders in art, 
music, world language, and wellness, transitioning from a 0.4 SML to a 0.6 SML. I know there's a lot of points, so let me explain it. Um, basically, these SMLs right now teach three out of five classes. So we're looking for them to teach two out of five classes next year, so to reduce their time. That's what the English, Math, Science, and History SMLs are currently doing. So if you remember, we, we decided to do this transition of reducing the SMLs, and I'll explain why in a minute. But we did it over the course of two years for budgetary reasons. So we did some this past year, and this is kind of the second kind of tier of them going down to 0.4. Um, the additional 0.6 FTE would be distributed across departments based on student need and scheduling when that process happens. Uh, but most importantly, it will allow us to keep the class sizes at the current level. The reason why I feel like the reduction in teaching uh, for the SMLs is so important uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, they're going to be able to work and assist members of their department uh, when it comes to uh, helping them deliver effective uh, evidence-based instruction, working to align curriculum, whether it's K through 12, 6 through 12, or 9 through 12, they all have different positions. Uh, providing additional support with the teacher evaluation process, which is very important, as well as helping with assessments and looking at assessment results. We talked about data at the middle school uh, presentation a minute ago, uh, and this idea of adjustment to practice. When they get the results, what are they going to do with it? And so they're going to be a big part in that process of helping out, and that's why they, the reduced time would help them be able to work with more teachers in that way. So that's really the top priority when it comes to the personnel account at the high school. In regards to the expense uh, accounts, we did our best to try to level fund most uh, of the accounts. Uh, in the FY17 budget, we do have three accounts that exceed $1,000. Uh, so I'd just like to talk about them really quickly. The reason why they are increasing is because of one of two things, either space or lack thereof. I believe we've talked about the lack of space at the high school as we continue to get bigger and bigger. And the other is our, our desire to continue to be innovative and, and adapt our approach and our instructional needs to meet the students where they're at as education continues to evolve. Um, so the first account I wanted to mention is the science supply account. Um, the increase is directly related to space concerns. Last year we took a computer lab and made that into a biology class. We still have a few more things, materials, equipment that we need to get to fully fund that room to be uh, functional So as a science lab. So that is where some of the increase comes from. We also have uh, an issue with our physics uh, classroom. So we have 13 science teachers, 10 science lab spaces. Only two of the 10 spaces are fully functional physics classrooms. We have three physics teachers, oftentimes they're teaching at the same time. So one of them is teaching with all the materials that they need, maybe at an AP or an honors level. So we're looking to just get the equipment and materials to have one of the rooms also be outfitted for physics. So that's really where the two increases are coming from in the science supply account. But it's, again, directly related to spaces, we're trying to maximize what we have. The next account is the library supply account, which uh, is, is connected both to space but also to our want to rethink the library space to be a space that's a more flexible learning environment to, to, to better meet the changing needs of our students and staff. Um, we are a fully one-to-one -one integrated school. Our teachers have worked extremely hard to adapt their approach in their classroom, and it's time that we rethink our library to adapt to that as well. Um, we want it to be more of a multi-purpose uh, space that facilitates group instruction, um, independent research, but also more importantly staff and student collaboration. Um, so this account increases are about updating and revising the current layout to kind of create more of a, a learning commons or a learning center feel. Um, it, it, the best way I could describe that is more, almost more of a college campus center in a way. Uh, we're looking to purchase taller bookshelves and put them on the exterior to open up the, the traffic in the library. Uh, maybe purchase some Apple TV so students can use that for group presentations or projects. Um, maybe get some flexible, uh, flexible configured furniture like the HEF people came and talked about earlier in that classroom that we have. Maybe some tables and chairs on wheels so kids can easily collaborate with one another. Teachers could also use this space to bring classrooms down for instruction, which would talk about the space issues that we're having, as well as it can be a location for staff to work with students who are working remotely on online classes, either hybrid or VHS classes that we have more and more kids doing. So that's something that we're excited about that we, we are looking forward to hopefully be able to rethink and, and renovate some of our library. The last account is around the technology and engineering account, which is a relatively new department, grades 6 through 12 here. Um, it's a department that supports our efforts to expand opportunities and offerings when we're talking about uh, real-world experiences and incorporating the 21st century skills of collaboration, communication, critical thinking skills, and creativity. Uh, we're going to offer some new classes, uh, including team robotics, sustainable engineering, 3D art, as well as a few other courses. 
Uh, and they're designed to build on the work that's being done here at the middle school with the Project Lead the Way courses. So it is our belief, we've talked a lot about this, that redefining some of these course offerings will attract more students as well as students who may, might not normally have taken an engineering or a design course. And that's what we're really trying to do, we're trying to build this program. So the increases are coming uh, about with needing more supplies, needing more updates for these improvements, for these course offerings, because this is a department that I feel like can become a very big department if we put the resources into it. And I think kids will absolutely love the course. We've even had more kids wanting to sign up for engineering over the past semester. So um, we're looking forward to those. And so that, that's really the highlights. Uh, again, we're, 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 we tried to be uh, put together a very responsible budget um, in terms of personnel and in, in, in terms of our expense account. So uh, those are really the highlights. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about the, the budget. So I, I have a question question that actually may be more for Mr. Dumas than you. Um, I was, as I was looking at the specific increases in the expense line items, I'm noticing we're not offsetting expense by revenue this year. What's the change there? The change is that uh, if you uh, would look back at the uh, estimated balance in the revolving account. For which one? Uh, for the F1 visa account. Um, it's uh, <laughs> getting down to a, a low number. Okay. that so yeah because we expended 335 yeah, and we're only taking in 200 so I get it but I guess my question is with respect to the f1 visa account we're still project you're still projecting a balance of about sixty thousand dollars at the end of FY 17 and so while I fundamentally understand why we leave some cushion in various revolving accounts I guess I'm not sure about that one well I'm not sure how many uh, uh, students are actually going to come next year okay so that's so you're being conservative based on the the revenue intake projection rather than leaving money in there yeah. okay yeah. all right I think I'm good. Yeah, you guys have any I, questions? I think my only question is around the um, the library supply because I'm I'm trying to understand. I, I understand what you're trying to do with mm -hmm. the library, but I'm also trying to understand it in relation to what we heard earlier from the HEF grant yep. and making that classroom. So it sounds very similar to me. So I'm trying to understand where we got a grant to do a classroom like that and now we want to spend $8,000 to do, make the library like that. Is it, be, is it because that one classroom is not enough for the size of the building? You know, what, can you help with that? Sure, and I can actually, you can, I can pass it on my computer. It's actually pictures of that classroom. Um, and it, it's, I think the grant is, was a for a smaller space. And I think we're realizing based on talking to the students in the class, uh, how much they enjoy it. The, the, the second they walk in, like, I feel like I'm in college right now. And that's what we're preparing them for, being career and, and college ready. And, uh, I think we, we, we want to have a bigger space that it, every kid can access, not just the students that take that particular math class, to answer your question. Okay. And if I could add to that, Lori. Um, <laughs> we need more mics the next time. I don't mind. I think you really have to put on, uh, you have to look at the available spaces in that building. We are really running out of available spaces. So in the library, this is actually doing two things. It's going to be a, an innovation space, but it's also going to allow us a space to have classes be in. Mm -hmm. So the most important thing there is getting the books out where they're all spread out now and get them on the periphery so we can start to use that space then as we see. That's something that you're not going to ask a grant to fund. This is something that we need to step up and support as part of the budget process is re redistributing the books, making sure that they're in a safe location, they're secured to the wall. We have to do that. That's not something that uh, you're going to put into a grant and it's no, not no, exciting I, and those types of things. I so, understand. I, I, yeah. wasn't, I wasn't making the suggestion that why isn't that a grant. I understand why the grant was no, used I, for that particular yeah. purpose. But the yeah. other thing I want to understand then too, and, and this may be a very... Um, it, it pains me to say this, but <laughs> an old school way of thinking of a library was to go in and study and have a quiet space. And what what this says to me is that that mentality of a library is changing. In that, so 
for kids that do need to have a place that, to study within the high school, and I don't even know that they have the time during the day to do that, but when I think about college, we went to the library to do some studying. Yes, you had some collaborative spaces, but for the most part, if you were going to do collaboration, you were going to go to another building and use a classroom or something. High school is still different than college, and I get that. But what I'm trying to understand is, are we taking away anything from the library by doing this? Like, are there uses of the library currently that they won't really be able to use if you're using it for a classroom space or you're having a more collaborative space? It's obviously going to be louder. You know, it's it's, it's going to be a change. Yeah, it, it's well, it's it's pretty loud now. Actually, but, um, <laughs> we, we uh, there is a room off of the library that we're going to have that be kind of the quiet study area for the students that want that. Gotcha. Uh, the way it is now, it's almost tucked around the back corner of okay. the library. But there is a room that is off of the library that, that would take that place. And if I could just add to that, Laura, you said one thing. You said uh, that uh, your recollections from college where you would go off and use an available classroom or something. That's really what we're bumping into here. Those classrooms are booked. We don't have those available spaces. Yeah, I, I just can't stress enough that the high school is pretty much at capacity. And when we start talking about bringing in more students, and we're running into the problem of that we'd like to split that. There's a lot of kids signed up for this block. Let's split it into two sections. The very first thing is, do we have any space at all to be able to do that? So it's not necessarily looking at what's best for students. It's about well, where we can't physically do that. So those are some of the conversations that, are, that we're having internally in terms of just trying to look at class sizes in this and how many sections can we run and what during this period, how are we going to make this work? That's a real concern, and so that's either going to require us to look at some very innovative things to do within the structure of the day, such as do all students need to be present at all times within the confines of the building, or we need to look at how do we add on to the high school. That's a really, that's a future conversation that we need to have, and it's pretty important. Can I, may I? Oh, please, don't mock my soapbox. All right, so I want to acknowledge um, I was really excited when Mr. Bishop came at, to, to the initial meeting uh, around his budget work with us. And I want to remind you of, of Mr. Gosha's budget and his focus on personnel. And so now we see kind of the opposite. Now we have a focus on expense. And Mr. Bishop participates in um, a job alike with other principals from surrounding schools and comes back with, you know, obviously with ideas, but also this idea of innovation and wanting to move forward and keep the momentum in our school going so that we have something really special it was so exciting to think about and hear about. And when I just heard you talk about the four C's, and you have to help me with the fourth, I've got collaboration, communication, creativity, and, yeah, critical, and critical thinking. We talked about that in our public forums uh, around the strategic plan and that we need to prepare kids to think and learn differently. And so this fits right in it to me. For me, it feels like it has that learning space that is providing kids with the opportunities to learn and think differently um, than we've done before because we don't want to prepare them to be the type of learner that we have been preparing them for. Um, things are going to be changing in our colleges as well and, and in our world. So we have wonderful resources around technology um, and wonderful instructors. Um, you could just hear the enthusiasm in Mr. Bishop's voice when he talks about some of the course offerings. It makes me feel like going back to high school. Um, I feel like I can't wait to see this space um, and to be able to, to just see how, how enthusiastic it's going to be for kids. Um, so I'll just add that piece because I think it reinforces that we do need to begin to think about doing things differently. So when I ask these questions, I'm not at all poo-pooing the. No, it doesn't um, feel and, like and, that. And also, it's it, it's more from this the, the mindset of the the public's always looking to understand that if you're looking to change the space, what are they going to be missing out on? Mm -hmm. the, they understand what you're going to gain, but they don't always think about what what do you what what might you lose in in changing the space. I fully agree that the way even private industry is moving is away from quiet spaces. I can say right now that I'm in the process of converting our corporate headquarters. I'm on the team for that. And they are looking at collaborative spaces and huddle rooms, not large conference rooms and not large quiet areas. No libraries, no file rooms, none of it. And, and so that is moving in that direction. So I, I applaud you for thinking outside the box and, and moving in that direction. I just know that from a public standpoint of, okay, we're, we're going to change something. What are we going to lose? 
and Bob, I'm sorry, but you're freaking me out by talking about losing space in the high school and we're just getting another building going. So I'm like, <laughs> we can't, it, it's hard it's to think reality. about those things. So I appreciate it. That's my only question on what, what you had presented because I, I felt like that was the one area that's, that's a pretty big shift in how we've seen libraries in the True. past and, True. and just want people to understand why behind it. And, and, and libraries have certainly changed and you're welcome to come in and take a look. It's just a different environment. The, the kids, with the, they have phones, they have their computer, There's a, they're doing a bunch of different things and talking to someone else and projecting up here. They don't sit and study like they used to. Or, and if they do, we do have that space for them. So, and it could be a meeting, a place for you guys to have your meetings. Oh. Yeah, great acoustics you can project. Yeah. <laughs> Just tag in. One of my kids happens to be in the classroom, the math classroom that has the new furniture. And the level of excitement to go to math class is you know, pretty surprising. I'm hearing a lot from from a lot of friends that just that simple, um, so that simple change. So what I what I wanted to say is one, I think these small things are really um, doing a lot to keep our students engaged and happy. And kids really enjoy going to our high school for the most part. I'm sure there are a few that don't want to get out of bed every morning. But uh, like I see the kids going in, they're so happy to be there. There's such a positive atmosphere at our high school and I think there are even small things like this that really lend to that but beyond that I think that um, being creative and innovative about maximizing the space that we already have there really is critical because we really we have tremendous staff we're, we're well resourced but kids are increasingly taking classes online um, that opens up a lot of um, opportunities that are otherwise constrained by the space that that we are dealing with. I can say for both of my kids, they have experienced significant challenges in scheduling courses that they want, all because it comes back to science and how many, how we're limited in science space and that drives the schedule and you can't, you know, the other class that you want is only offered the only time you can take your science class. And so there are a lot of impacts like that, that this in my mind is small money that will make a shift in the ability for the kids to get the classes that they want to get. And again, just sort of tailors and personalizes the, the um, curriculum and increases their engagement in it within the context of, you, you know, the graduation requirements and everything else. So I, I actually was, you know, usually we like to go down in expenses, but I, I thought that both of these really added a lot of value um, and added a lot of breadth and flexibility when we can't do that physically when we can't put an addition on our high school right now so this is just a better use of um, or will allow I think better use of the space that we do have so I don't have any questions so I just thought it was well thought out I already asked my question okay. <laughs> As a child of the bubble class oh. Oh. mother of a child of the bubble class I'm very worried about the space but so I I have not yet been to the high school, so I appreciate hearing firsthand from, you know, obviously you and from Jean from a mom's perspective there on space and, and the impact. I just had one very simple question. Do kids, I know you have books in your library, do, do people still check out books at the high school level? Not very Is that often. part of this too? Is not, that, not very yeah. Often. So we're going to look at part all of this will be a book inventory as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and maybe trim that down a little bit. Okay. Yeah. That was just something I thought was interesting to your point of what is a library used for anymore? Well, and the Books. other thing is the town is building a new library. That's why this so. one is going to be, um, I think that's why that <laughs> caught my eye too is because around all the discussion that went into the town with their library group. That's all. Thank you. So mine isn't a budget question, but it, I've, I've actually been meaning to ask and since we're talking about the science labs. Do we have hoods? Uh, yes, we do. We do. Yeah. Because <laughs> there was that explosion, right? In Fairfax, and someone asked me, and I said, I, "Can I we'll find that out? We do. Oh, we absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's for okay, chemistry, so bio. Yeah. Really, yeah. neither here nor there. Do you guys? <laughs> <laughs> Glad we're safe. Since you're here. I you as a chemist, not as a. Yeah, I think um, great thoughts and good plan certainly. Be excited uh, looking at the technology and engineering programs. Mm -hmm. I think robotics has been missing uh, for some time, so this opens up a great horizon. So, and I'm just, uh, from a budget perspective, curious: uh, what were the 
that obviously you have prioritized and um, must have put on a lot of thoughts around. Uh, what was the cut around the 75K? It, it was um, some personnel and, and quite a few supply lines. Yeah. yeah but mainly personnel? Ma yeah, so, yeah, a little bit of both. Yep, yep. Yeah, we did our best to try to cut the supply lines even lower than they had been in FY16, but some of it was from personnel. But we had to prioritize, and yeah. our priority was the reduction in SMLs because we feel like that is extremely important for effective instruction and being a, a coach of teachers. That is a, a very, very important, similar to the reading coach. Yep. Thank you. Oh, very good. Nice no questions. Thank wow. <laughs> Appreciate you guys giving us the big microphone. <laughs> you don't want to be that close. Well, I would have felt a little Gene awkward. Gene would have been a little. <laughs> Just pass it down the line. Uh, no, it was a, a good presentation. It's um, like Laurie, I'm a little concerned about hearing about space constraints, and it sounds like this is going to be a little bit of a flex space in addition to improving the, the library atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, but, but no, good, uh, good outline. Thank you. I don't really have any questions. Should we call it Eric Jones? We have room. Let me grab yeah. another chair. <laughs> we need to expand. Oh, we do space, space constraints. constraints. Yeah. Yes, we do. We actually have mic we'll constraints. Like, yeah. Let <laughs> 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 me go here. Let me go there. Let me go through all of our numbers. Bobby can share a chair with Kathy. See, if those chairs oh, were on he, wheels, he wants that would have been so much easier. <laughs> I apologize. I have to step out. I'm getting buzzed a lot here okay. from, from home, so okay. my chair is my chair is open. Thank there you. you. Thanks for coming. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Yes. Uh, good evening. Thank you um, for being here. Uh, the highlights of the executive summary for athletics: uh, the athletic department maintains the current programs with only slight increases due to contractual obligations. Um, the budget does not include a separate standalone budget neutral pr proposal for a two-year pilot for, boys and, for a boys and girls alpine ski team. Personnel summary, there's no additional uh, positions in the budget that are being funded. If we had an additional ski coach for a new pilot program, that would be um, set up outside the budget. Uh, in terms of the expenses for athletics, the athletic coaches account is up 9,847 due to step increases and a lower offset figure. Athletic contractor Contracted services is being increased by $7,089 to account for increases in bus costs, ICE rental, and officials fees. All of the other um, supply accounts are all being level funded with no increases. So can you give a little bit more background and, and overview on the, um, the ski team coach? Yes. Um, uh, not only what you're proposing for next year, but, but um, the, the school committee has been hearing a lot of very interested, uh, from a lot of very interested supporters. Um, and we've had conversations um, with this group. So maybe give the background on, on what. Yeah, I mean, over the years that I've been here, different, um, you know, there's been bubbles of interest in certain new sports and programs. Um, we've been fortunate that during good times, bad times, we've never cut any teams, never cut any programs, uh, both from a budget standpoint and also participation standpoint. Every school in our league has definitely lost teams. Uh, usually due to participation, especially in the last couple of years. So when, you know, Ralph gave those participation numbers, well, you know, down a, a few students um, maybe in the last year or so, we're still very strong in terms of our participation levels. Uh, every freshman team is fielded, where in the other schools we'll do a schedule and uh, a few days into tryout time they'll be dropping out and I'm looking for new teams because they can't, they don't have the numbers. Good-sized schools, schools that are at the you know, just below us in the Tri-Valley League. So in terms of our numbers, they're still very strong. Um, in terms of new programs in sports, just a quick background um, in terms of because one of the things that came about was a potential uh, to co-op with Ashland, and it, it kind of started late last spring. It was after the budget process. At that time, Ashland and, and the, their athletic director, at the, at the athletic director at the time, who's now since moved on, we had basically told them the same thing, that, you know, you go off as a club team, we you know, pointed them towards recreation and so on, and then we'd look at it next year in the budget process. They got a new athletic director. Things kind of fast-tracked in a different direction early this fall. Um, uh, we kind of stuck to the way we do things, and also some schools will self-fund and do all kinds of different things. We've always fully funded sports. Uh, so to deal with the ski program and other sports, and just in the last probably two weeks, I've heard from people with interest in rugby, which the MI just adopted. 
Um, someone's emailed me about gymnastics. So I put together a proposal that ran uh, through Evan and Kathy uh, to have two-year pilot programs for any new program. Um, when we would do this, the head coach would be paid a $2,000 stipend uh, for, the two, for the two years while it's a pilot program. So it wouldn't be on the units and steps of our, our current contract. Uh, during the two years, we doubled the athletic fee for the new programs during the pilot. So depending on what the fee is, uh, the double could be uh, 210 to 220. Uh, the cost of the new program would be greatly minimized with the lower coaching salary and increased athletic fee with the idea being we money in, money out to cover it. Any excess costs which should be minimal could be covered through the athletic revolving account. Any, um, any issues with minor equipment or using ski as an example, racing bibs, et cetera, the Hopkinton Booster Club I'm sure would help us uh, with um, some of the equipment needs for a new program. Uh, the p point being, after two years, the pilot program, depending on interest, sustainability, feasibility, how it's gone, it could be discontinued, or if sustainable, uh, it could be fully adopted in the athletic program with full financial support. They would then pay whatever the current athletic fee is at that time, and the coach would be put on an according step of units uh, in the uh, contract at a determined amount. So. The plan would be if this would if this would go through would be to try to start a ski program of our own next year uh, just again giving just some of the details our numbers from what the people tell us are, are, are pretty solid where you have to follow certain guidelines for co-ops where if you have too many kids you're not supposed to become a co-op with another school um, and also in case we didn't there is other schools in the Tri-Valley League that don't have it and might be interested in being um, a host I'm sorry, as the guest in joining our team. So we do have those options as well for, uh, that would also minimize cost if we were to take on another uh, school as a partner. So, I just want to understand that the pilot program, is that a policy currently? No. 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 Oh, it would be a way of allowing us to maintain, <coughs> maintain control while gauging interest and still allowing kids to compete. Mm -hmm. So what we had understood in looking at this as a uh, potential co-op was that we could, we could participate, but the kids couldn't race. And if kids were not going to be able to race, then there was not going to be any interest. Um, but in doing so with potentially another town that maybe doesn't do things the way, as Eric has said, we do things here in terms of fully funding our, our athletics, um, it allows us some time to evaluate but still maintain control. Um, so it is a new proposal. It's, it's something outside of our current athletic program. But if this, and this, to be clear, is not for FY17, right? Uh, the proposal, proposal would be, it's not in evaluate. the budget, but it would be to put it Sorry. forward with the ski team for next year. But the, but the, peop the, the um, parents that we've been hearing from were for, for, this, for this ski year. season. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So this oh, is right. Like, this would not like be for December. the current. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so the the other question I have is, I mean, obviously what we've been hearing from the public is about the Alpine ski team. You mentioned there's been inquiries on rugby and on gymnastics. Are, are, so if we were to put in this pilot program policy, how, what's the, cri I guess what's the criteria for how many we could pilot at a time mm -hmm. and you know, how do you choose? Yeah, exactly. Like, who, who makes that decision? Well, I, th I think the, it would be determined by interest, and we, we have seen quite a bit of interest from the ski group, and then moving forward, it would really, really just like clubs at the high school, kind of student-generated support. Like, some kids now are, you know, are talking <coughs> about the rugby thing, and often clubs start it the same way at the high school. So you really want it to be kind of student-generated first to see what kind of interest there is, um, and also by, you know, Eas they could easily start a rugby club, so that would be a starting point for a sport possibly like that. Obviously, other sports like gymnastics, that's a whole different animal because of off-site and equipment and so on. Uh, but you know, right now there's Frisbee football, which isn't an MIA sport, but the kids have their own club and they organize and we give them field space and, and they play other schools in the spring. So I think student-generated support. Obviously, if all of a sudden we had a lot of uh, different sports and ideas, we could kind of you know, put together a survey and stuff like that. But right now, um, you know, the ski had, it had a very strong group that was kind of very well organized and backing it. And they, and they, they do, you know, have pretty strong numbers where we probably would be pretty close to being either having our own team or, or um, only looking to add someone who had, you know, a few kids interested in joining us. So m my only comment 
isn't about what sport we do a pilot program. I, I think the pilot program idea is is very strong and, and how to keep it as budget neutral as possible while you're trying it out to see where the interest lies and and how that whole system would work out with other schools you'd be competing with. Um, but I do have concerns over not having criteria for what sports get piloted because I think that while I agree that it should be student driven and the interest should be student driven, whether or not the students are aware that it needs to be student driven and how to even drive that idea and and then uh, if you do come up with a situation where you happen to have a year where you have a very active student community and they come up with five that they want to pilot is that even possible um, and I'm not aware because I'm not aware from the the intricacies of the budget of whether or not that would be possible but and maybe it would be because of the, the neutrality of what we're trying to put in place mm -hmm. maybe it depends on the size of the sport you know if there's 30 kids that might want to be on the Alpine ski team, if they're paying reduced, you know, the double fee, then that's going to get close to that $2,000 a coach. But if it's uh, another yep, sport yep, that yep. doesn't have that many kids, we wouldn't, we might not be able to reach that $2,000. Well, I just want to make sure that it's fair, so that yeah. some sports don't, <laughs> don't feel marginalized compared to others, even in a pilot program. Well, and I think the MIA has to be. It has to be affiliated with yeah, it has to be an MI-approved right. sport. That's so you're, you're, I mean, we offer a pretty rich program. So you know, there's only a few other things out there like sailing, gymnastics. There's actually Nordic skiing. Rugby literally has right. just been started. So it's not like anybody has a rugby team. So you're still talking about uh, very few sports. And in the case of rugby, it's basically just in its infancy in terms so, of what so the from state. the menu of sports that the MIA yep. is. We, we already boys offer many is, of them. Boys anyway. volleyball is one more. I see. Okay. And that could be part of the criteria, but we could certainly look into creating mm -hmm. criteria. So you're making a distinction between a sport and a club, basically, based on what the MIAA legitimizes, I guess, for lack of a better word. And so I, that, that was what my question was going to be. And it sounds like we're close to hitting the maximum. We're close to offering the maximum of what they cover, regulate. Whatever. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a so, few still out there, but we're but very, not, we have a very not rich not a long program. list. And then if it, and the distinction, from what I'm hearing, is if it's not on that list, then you're talking about a club, and we already have a pre a procedure, if not a policy, about how clubs come into um, being at the high school. My only question, um, and I know I interrupted. I'm sorry, but before I lose it, is that when that happens, I believe it's in the contract that there's a one year trial and before it gets added to the stipend list and I just want to make sure that that's not going to be a conflict if what we're talking about for a pilot of a sports team as a two-year um, trial I just and that's the, a, that's a question we don't a, need to a answer a formal it. MI yeah, team so that would take it from another step uh, it would but if I just want to make sure our contract rugby rugby could potentially start as a club under that, but if they wanted to become MI, then they'd go into the pilot under these guidelines, because then it would be an MI sport. Yeah, no, I think I don't think it's something we're going to solve today. I just want to make sure that we are mindful about the contract impact when we formalize that. But um, <coughs> but I th I think the way that you've structured it makes it easy to say yes to because it there's really no impact until you know that it's going to really be um, sustainable and I think we didn't have another option for the girls hockey but that was you know the co-op if I remember that conversation that has to be redetermined every year based on the number of kids right. whereas this is our own pilot and it doesn't impact it doesn't involve a conversation with a different district and no not at this time yeah since I already interrupted, can I just ask the rest of my question? Oh, I didn't have anything okay, else, so you're sorry. good. Go um, ahead. <laughs> just as far as transportation, where are they skiing and how are they getting there? Um, the current group? or Well, where would they go? Like, I remember well, the parents had to, to drive the those, kids. But likely um, there's a, a league in Central Mass, Wachusett, and, and again, you know, there's different places, um, Blue Hills, but most of them from this area go up to Wachusett to ski. And would it be parent transportation the way we did with well, the hockey? Well, I, I would think so, especially if we're trying to, un under the pilot the staying um, budget neutral. Okay. Can you further expand? Well, first, unless I missed it, we didn't get a write-up of what this would look like, right? Like no, I was writing various not. notes down about no, so double this and half this when it gets to be, you know, can we get that? Absolutely. 
in yep, some yep. kind of more formalized way. And then specifically, what does it mean to be budget neutral? I thought I heard that it was to offset the cost of the coach stipend, but I mean, lift tickets are well again expensive. If we were going to go with that, I mean, even as we were t when we were going through the budget of whether or not we were going to put this in, you could set it up where they're paying for their own lift tickets as and well. Their own I mean, equipment and their yeah, own oh, equipment yeah, would be anyway. Um, I mean, it gets back to I guess some of the conversation about like a like a sport like ice hockey. Well, ice hockey obviously has a good amount of uh, fairly expensive equipment and skates that's their own. Um, we don't transport our hockey team to practice, so they're paying for their transportation to get to practice. They're actually paying for their transportation to get to a home game in Marlboro. Uh, so you know, here we'd be asking them probably. Um, and again, the ski season is shorter than other seasons. Their amount of competitions is 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 shorter. Uh, and again, so they'd probably be under our pilot would be getting there on their own, but it's not unlike some of our other sports that partially um, get there on their own, the swim team, uh, the golf team, um, for, um, you know, to get to Navin and to Navin, Keefe Tech, and to Hopkinton Country Club. So if you're on a pilot, this is all just kind of theoretical, if you're in a pilot, <coughs> here's how it would work, and then within that time period, you put together how it would work if it graduates to funded mm -hmm. and then then it's a yes or a no you don't have to right okay and then one question that's not ski related the second line item under expense summary is this all specific to hockey or is ice rental just in there because it also contributed to the it also contributes um, so buses is across the board officials typically go up a little bit every year across and the obviously board, ice rental is you know okay it's so it's not seven thousand dollars for hockey. Oh, I mean, no. this was everything. No, that's all sports, okay. correct. All right, thanks. So I'm conceptually aligned with the, the pilot idea, but we're not having a budget conversation about that tonight, right? I mean, it's no. not a budget impact, and I think all the right. questions were sort of saying this is concept, like, I think what should happen is if this is an idea we want to pursue, uh, this should be further vetted and come back. Right, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay. It's not we, for us to in any no, way make any determination or even, I mean, no. it, we're not no. remotely fully baked it up to be talking about this tonight. No, it's included more because the request to join the Ashland Co-op came up and, yeah. was, and, and it was too late to be part of the budget recommendation for mm -hmm. this year. Um, and then I know there's a lot of public interest. So uh, it, it's all been within recent weeks um, that the proposal that we could consider that the school committee could consider would come back for further discussion. Yeah. Um, we just wanted to make it clear that we're not recommending that we participate right. in a team this year. In the process of the budget. Right. This is ir largely irrelevant to the budget. It is. Correct. Okay. Not largely, totally irrelevant to the budget. Okay. And then that <laughs> will come back as a separate that item for what back. we're discussing tonight. This is not yeah, nope. this is not okay. Okay. Um so the only I'm going to keep going back to this one. The only question I have then related to the budget is is going to keep coming back to this question, which is that under the first expense summary it says lower offset figure um, is part of the nine thousand eight hundred forty seven difference, but we don't. I'm, the nine thousand eight hundred forty seven dollars is being driven by contractual. Just step. It's not lower offset. It's one hundred and ten is what's assumed in there. Okay. All right. I'm fine then. Um, I guess I'm still confused, I feel like, despite the, all the conversation about what was being asked. So we were being asked to join the Ashland Co-op. Mm -hmm. That would have had a budget impact because that would have been treated like hockey, right? Where we'd have to pay a fee to Ashland. And we didn't even get to the point that it would have a budget impact. We were not able, based on MIA uh, policies, or procedures to participate. So we didn't even get to saying that there would be a budget impact because, help me out, Eric. Um, um, so it, as we were talking to them, Medfield also came along. Yeah. So they actually co-opt with Medfield um, in the process. And again, their process, the, the ideal way for a co-op is discussions at the building level, at central office, then coming to you, where this was at, this was you know driven kind of outside. They went to Ashland and were like, "Here, here's the program. You know, we want, we have a coach, we have all this in place." And Ashland, um, you know, again, different policies saying, "Okay, you you can sell, you can self fund it and go with the program and kind of put their stamp of approval on it." 
kind of like adding something to your program of studies from the outside versus deciding internally and going through the process. And we had we had spoken last year to them that we were we were a year away from doing it the way you know the, through our proper procedures. And we've always self-funded our programs, uh, so we you know we don't have anything in place. And we've you know I would not want to self-fund programs because then you're gonna everybody who comes. And you know now you might have a program for a year. That group's gone. You know who's paying for it, who's running it, et cetera. So having school control over it, um, you know, there's so many things that go into an athletic program, team, a coach, certifications, all these other things that that we're able to you know have control over. Where in this case, even though we would have been the guest, you know, those things came. You know, those things weren't really vetted out in, in a in a full process. I just ask one thing about what he just said. Sure. When you say that it came from the outside, is that that the MIA came to Ashland? No, the, it was it was organized, um, you know, by the the groups of parents from both communities. Oh. And, and at Ashland, they were they were kind of getting an okay. Um, and our process and procedures are different. Like uh, like I think Evan said about you know when you have different communities that have different uh, procedures for adding teams, how they treat teams, um, that makes it difficult to um, you know be on the same page putting a team together. So I, I feel still confused, but I think... Oh, I understand. I, I don't blame you. So we could not, under any scenario, approve a co-op ski team, even if we had it in the budget for this year. Right, because because of the procedures that and the steps that have to be taken. Okay. And and what we learned was that, as Eric has in, indicated, um, that there are regulations around participation based on the numbers mm -hmm. in your community that are interested. So none of these things were fully vetted um, until there was an enthusiastic group of people who really wanted to be able to join to join Ashland. Um, but according to MIAA, in order for us to do it properly in a way that we would feel comfortable as a district. We would need to take the steps that Eric just described. Okay. Um, I, we simply added it as a placeholder to let the school committee understand that this is something that we want to explore more, more in more depth um, because we do have a lot of interested people in the community and we will be coming back to you with a more thorough plan in terms of how we can recommend uh, getting there. Okay, so let's Co-op is not an option. We're, we're thinking about doing it ourselves, the pilot program. And then what's the reason why we, that couldn't be implemented for this year? For 16 or 17? Right. Uh, no. Tomorrow. I mean. For tomorrow? Yeah. No, because it's self-fund. So it's not a co-op. It's, it's the pilot. Right. Because we, we haven't gone through the steps to all of a sudden have a pilot in front of us. It's right it's December so we haven't gone through the steps that Eric is proposing now that we do for the following year it came to us as hey you want to join a co-op yeah. um, I'm simplifying and the comparison that I heard was well it, you did it with girls hockey, hockey. but yeah. as Eric has explained to me girls hockey was already an established team they needed a few more members to make them to so that to enable them to be able to compete um, so that's the difference and we were kind of not prepared as a district because we hadn't followed the procedures that we follow in establishing a new team um, to be able to um, agree to participate. And we could have participated as a club, but that would have meant that the kids could participate, just kind of go skiing, but not compete. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. There's no decision in front of us to right. have hockey this year. Or no, have not hockey. hockey. Skiing. I mean, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> I'll right. find There's no proposal. As Sorry. Kathy said, this is kind of where we want to take it. And so we, you, you okay. know, because obviously you guys <laughs> have heard from people about the interest. And, and we've gone through all kinds of different discussions about this. And this is what I kind of came up with and ran by them so we can move it forward and try to add it for the future. So okay. one, one additional question that comes out of this for me is, um, the procedures that we're saying that we need to go through to get there, are those established already? Or do those need to be created as well? There are MIA 
MIAA procedures, right, Eric? Right. Well, in terms of the co-op, the co-op actually... I don't actually need to know what they are okay. right now. I yeah. just want to know if, yes. if they exist. Because my, my question really stems from the fact that I'm not entirely sure that the community is aware of the procedural hurdles that are preventing it from happening this year. And whether or not those could be communicated yeah. differently might actually assist in the understanding of the time constraints that we're obviously under in wanting it this year. Now, what's also very interesting to me is that there's no snow anywhere, so no one's skiing right now, but... Um, I mean, there have been multiple meetings, Lori. There, there might be misunderstanding, but there's been multiple meetings at the high school to, to, to look into this. Um, I was at the most recent one, and so I don't know if there's a spokesperson for the, this group of parents um, or if there's something that needs to come from the high school. Um, I, I do know that you've been receiving a lot of, of emails in support of the concept of a team. Right, and so I guess, so I obviously all of us are new to the discussion, and so I don't know what meetings have happened. Obviously, we're all just talking about this tonight, so I'm just trying to make sure that if, if there is some misunderstanding out there about the timeline and the availability for Hopkinton this year, that that be clearly articulated so that that, that there isn't a feeling of it's just being dismissed. Okay. Um, but I, I, I think that it's been well thought out for how to pilot these programs going forward, and, I, and I, I'm excited about it for mm -hmm. the district. Um, but I, I just, uh, from the, the way that the email traffic has been coming to us, and that's the only communication I've been having, it, it sounds a bit desperate, like we're their last hope. And, and what I'm understanding is that there's a lot more involved here. Right. Um, what I will <coughs> ask you to do, Eric, I know that there was a response that you provided. Um, you copied everybody that had been at that meeting. Um, perhaps uh, a recommendation that that response that you sent to the, to the group, um, I will share that with the school committee, but perhaps um, a follow-up to ask mm -hmm. the individuals to share it with the group in general. Mm -hmm. um, because it does seem that the conversations and the recommendations and the research that you did in response to my requests hasn't been fully, hasn't been shared with, with the whole group. And so. the process has obviously been ongoing, like Kathy said, just in the last couple of weeks, and obviously the budget process has a lot to do with it in the future. Um, so to have told people, well, yeah, we'll do it next year, we couldn't say that. We're trying to work something out. Obviously budgets are tight, and that's why trying to have a proposal like this, where, hey, we can try this pilot program, so it's not right away having a large impact on the budget. So it's all kind of been happening as we go through the budget process in the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Mr. Manning, do you have any questions about the athletic budget? <laughs> I mean, not the, the viability of a ski Program. team, but maybe <laughs> just the <laughs> 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 I actually am interested in the ski team. I know it's, it's neutral, <laughs> but I'd like to see it, you know, especially when you compare it to the gymnastics, when you see about what's going forward, there should be a ballpark of if we do you do adopt it as a program. What's the cost going to be? I, you know, I'm not familiar with the hockey or the trans. To me, it's the transportation costs that are going to be. If you go to Wachusett, it, that, that to the bus. But you're saying that wouldn't be the case. Yeah. But really, just projecting ahead because you don't want to disappoint. Oh yeah, we're going to do this. It's people love it. But then all of a sudden, you bring it to the budget in three years or two years, and you're like, whoa. Yeah. No, that would be part and of that's our process. That's what I'm saying. That's yeah. you know, when you're comp you're almost saying what's bang for the buck in terms of mm -hmm. if. The, volleyball team you know, or, or, or rugby, it's right here, it's right at the school, so obviously you can get a lot of people to do it and it might be better, but that's part of the discussion mm -hmm. or the decision. So that, that's all I'm going to say on what's the cost. I know it's neutral, but you really want to start thinking ahead. As yeah, we've worked out some of the estimates, obviously, um, as we were trying to decide whether you, we could fund it, and, and so I do have some of those estimates and we'll obviously be putting those together for the future if we were going to put it, bring it to a program that we're going to fund. So, I mean, I think that's a valid point for all of these are for what needs to be included in the pilot, in our pilot policy or of, of sports or whatever, which I think would be great to take up um, in the near future because obviously there's a lot of interest and I, I know things, even if we move as fast as we can, it's not as fast as other people might like it to happen, and it just is the way that it is. The MI actually says that they want them in six months in advance on a co-op, but they don't, 
they're flexible on it, but the point is, and if you, their language is just for that purpose of going through the athletic department, <coughs> through the building administration, mm -hmm. central administration, and school committee to allow kind of to make sure that everyone's on board and also verifying numbers of, of how many participants from multi sometimes multiple schools. Okay. They're done. Okay. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> Can you wait? Can we do the... Um, yeah. I'm going to check. So in. the next is um, new business item: high school girls hockey field trip to the vineyard. World on budget. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. you See you in January. Are you guys opposed to doing? I don't know. We had guests. Were you guys here to do public comment and you don't want to wait, you know, till you hear about I don't the know, ski midnight? Yeah. What did you want to did you want to participate in public comment or were you just here to listen? Sure. Is anyone opposed to moving public comment? No, it's fine no. now. No. I'm on up for public okay. comment. Are you doing the timer? We're, we're oh, right, oh there. right here. I have to pull off here. I know what this should be. My never agenda. Happen. My high tech yeah. agenda. Yeah. Or you got it. My attorney with me, so I. Uh, <laughs> Your name and so. address, and you have three minutes. Uh, Drew Schlussel, 9 Lincoln Street, Hopkinton, Mass. Um, great presentation. Uh, I just want to clarify a few things. Uh, it's Mount Ward in Shrewsbury, okay. which is the predominant location, which is a lot closer. And uh, yep, parents are typically the primary uh, vehicle to get the kids there. Um, and then judging by. Um, the, the uh, level of, of anticipation uh, a lot of folks are pretty excited about it um, definitely did not understand the timeline so my question is it, you know for next year is there a timeline that we can understand that we would need to hit milestones in order to help make that happen I think right. that's a great question I think that's part of what we're gonna have maybe come back with this like proposal for the pilot program so that we have that straightened out and knowing that everybody wants it for next year okay and then the only other comment is that um, I understand the need to have perhaps a higher fee to perhaps compensate if there's lower enrollment to make it still happen but if it's possible to have some kind of a curve where if they get past a certain enrollment level the fee can actually decline um, and maybe come back to a normal sport fee if there's a massive uh, interest um, yeah we will make sure that you know, um, communicate through Eric to okay. the parent group to make sure that you're aware of when we bring it back to school committee for further discussion and further planning going forward. Yeah, the, the timeline would be key because we certainly yep. want to make sure that, the, uh, that we're giving all the support that you need Great. to help make that happen. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dan Barry, 7 Nicholas Road, Hopkinton. And just to underscore the point, first of all, thank you. I thought it was a great discussion. Just to underscore the uh, the point that there is a lot of support for this in the community. Myself and Drew and a handful of other parents have been involved with this since the spring. Uh, and we've put a lot of work into looking into some of the details that were discussed here tonight to include the costs of um, practicing at Ski Ward, the cost of the ski tickets for the racers. Um, the fact that the parents would have to come with the equipment and what that equipment would be, the bibs. We have all of that detail and we can provide it to whomever needs it um, to facilitate this discussion. But there is a tremendous amount of interest for this team in the community. I, I think it, it, the, the discussion got sidetracked because of the co-op piece of it. And yes, that's where agreed. I think it got sidetracked. And, and so I think we, what we want to do now is we want to begin from scratch and do it right. Yep. And so we will definitely be reaching out to you um, to help us in, with all the information that you have. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay. Sorry. Now we're going to hit new business, high school girls field hockey, field trip to the vineyards. So I, I asked um, um, Eric t to stay for this piece. You have before you an intent to travel request 
for a high school trip for the girls ice hockey team. I do believe it went last year. Um, no, this is ice hockey. Sorry, this I is a first time hockey. trip. This is <laughs> where we're the guest of the co-op with Dover Sherborne. So they didn't they, go. They didn't go last no, year on a field, 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 field hockey. Field has hockey. Field That's hockey different. Did. I got <laughs> <laughs> not to the vineyard, but field ice hockey so has. This is new. This is new. We're being asked to go as guests. One of the school committee members asked me to clarify that there were not, in fact, any supervisors going from our. Correct. But are there parents? Um, there's parents that. Um, who are going with along the trip? So there's parents from both teams yeah. um, who are going there to make you know it says it says a weekend out of it. So is that? I guess the question is: Is that not having anyone from Hopkinton School District as a chaperone? Is that consistent with policy? If we're if we're if we're approving the intent to travel from a Mm -hmm. liability, et cetera, standpoint, we don't have any staff members who are chaperoning this trip. Um, does it make a difference with respect to policy, the question is, is that, that we are being invited as guests? Does that make any difference in terms of this is their organized trip? Correct. They've, they have followed all of the um, regulations and policies <coughs> and approvals of Dover Sherborne. We're guests at, as part of this co-op team so does that I mean it's it's in line with everything else with this team as a guest we we pay a per athlete fee they provide the medical coverage they provide the athletic director supervision the coach etc we we touch base we go to some games but they're the ones who are fully kind of running the program and we're there as the guest in this co-op and the itinerary is here, I believe, to answer your question, John, that what we're asking, asking of the school committee is to approve the intent to travel as guests, right? So because w this is not our organized trip, we have parental consent and permission um, for their students to participate, but it's not our organized trip. So I understand your, your question in terms of your, your policy would dictate that you're approving a trip that has been organized within our district. I wonder, however, for example, some of the trips that, that we bring to you to approve as intent to travel are actually organized by outside, right. like EF tours. I mean, I think our policy is that we have to approve overnight travel. Right. Right, so that, right. So that is relevant here. There, there are chaperones provided, which we also require, but they're not necessarily Hopkinton chaperones, but for yeah. example, on other field trips, while there may be some Hopkinton chaperones, they're not exclusively Hopkinton chaperones. So I, I don't think, I think it still fits. I think we're still comfortable under the umbrella of our policy. If that's yeah, and I actually just, I was pulling it up. I, I just found it. So it does, it does look like we don't specify, we say adequate chaperone coverage must be provided. We don't specify that that has to be district members. And I assume we'll confirm, the only thing we have in here is that they must be Corey cleared. So I assume we're going to confirm that. Yes. Guess we're and that at least one chaperone has CPR certification. That would okay. be the, okay. the coach. The coach. And we've worked with Dover, and we, okay. we know the coach, and he works with the girls off-site, but it, mm -hmm. we have yeah. confidence in him. But I fully support the trip. It was just that was a little bit unusual from a policy perspective, yeah. so that's, that's why a good I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at the form deadline. Is there a reason why this is coming in so close to when the trip is being held? Um, well, the, the trip was organized um, and put together during the fall, and obviously our participation in terms of numbers and kids gets determined in early December. Um, so typically ath athletic um, games and things like that, there's no way typically you're going to get before that okay. kind of date. So it came up in the fall? Mm -hmm. Okay. There was a bit of, back of, bit of back and forth, Kelly, because this is an unusual trip. So when it was initially proposed to me, it, it, it was not, it didn't fit the, um, it wasn't clear to me um, in terms of some of the questions that you've just asked. So it, had, it went back and then it was redone. So there's been a bit of back and forth and then trying to get it on um, in, in sufficient time to plan the agenda is basically what okay. it comes down to. Thanks. Well, I would also assume, given the reevaluation that happens every year with the co-op, that you don't you didn't necessarily know our girls were right. going to be invited. They're, they might have had too many girls. Would our girls even make the team? So I would imagine that was a factor as well. Correct. Right, so tryouts just happened essentially a couple weeks ago. All right, so there's a motion in front of you. 
Um, does anyone have any comments or questions on the motion? Okay. I would seek a motion to approve the field trip for the high school girls hockey team to take place. So moved. Seconded. Motion by Ms. Birchman, second by Ms. Nickerson. All those in favor? Yes. 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 It's unanimous and so carries. There you go. So um, to this point, because it's field trips, we have followed up. I know that somebody asked me, are, when are we going to see the final approvals for the um, trips that we receive for, for next year's international travel? Um, and I've been working with Evan on that, and we will be providing an update for you. Um, I think the first meeting in January is what we're, what we're yep. on FY. 16's trips okay. um, and I know there's been some questions around safety etc but we'll have an update for you at the end of upcoming meeting this, these are all questions that we're pursuing and following up with EF tours and parents and all of those things are things that Evan been, has been doing um, and I have it scheduled I believe for the first meeting in January because the second meeting in January already we're looking at FY 17 or yeah 2017 trips so <laughs> right because we have to get those recommendations in at, together so um, thanks for a great great presentation it was excellent thank you very much for coming um, Eric thank you and thank you very much yeah you're not staying Oops. there's more, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> but wait <laughs> Next project. item is the Park MCAS. Park MCAS. Yeah. Capital important. Project School Department Article Warrant Number 16-029 in the amount of $108,236.95. Um, for consideration is the request and recommendation of the superintendent for payment of the invoices for the capital project as appropriated in Articles 24 and 26. There's a recommended motion before you. Are there any um, comments on the motion? Would anyone like to make the motion? So I'll move to approve the payment of warrant number 16-029 in the amount of $108,236.95 to the vendors outlined in the warrant. Seconded. Motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Nickerson. All those in favor? Yes. 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 It's unanimous, so it carries. Next item is joint capital project with the town in the amount of $15,348.10. For our consideration is the request and recommendation of the superintendent for payment of a joint capital project as appropriated in Article 23. Are there any comments or questions on the recommended motion before you? I would seek a motion then to approve the payment of $15,348.10 to Vendor is indicated on the request for payment joint capital form. So moved. Seconded. Motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Nickerson. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Unanimous and so carries. Next is um, the MCAS Park participation for 2016. For consideration is the request and recommendation of the superintendent to provide a decision to DESE regarding the district's participation in MCAS or PARC. The districts that participated in MCAS tw in 2015 have a choice between MCAS and PARC for 2016. The recommendation is that we continue to participate in MCAS for spring of 2016. There's a recommended motion before you. Do you guys have any comments or questions or looking for um, more information from Dr. McLeod? I feel like the comment I have is why would any district switch to PARC <laughs> right now given the, what is happening? Can I, you, I just can read I an article about answer? this. Because they want to be held harmless, mm. which for me is oh, oh then yeah. I even more enthusiastically yeah, support exactly. the recommendation. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I just thought it was because so they, they, they were doing. So if you're held harmless, I, I mean, you've already talked to, about this, but I just want to reiterate that you then does that at all impact the level two designation mm -hmm. or no? You just stay. Yeah. Like you just can't stay at level two. Like you can't get out of it. You can't get out of it. You is what I'm saying. Like you you don't get down. worse. <laughs> oh, right. Right. No, it yeah. doesn't make any sense for us. I understand that it might make sense for some districts who want to become familiar with what we don't even know is the test of what it's going to be. But um, I do feel for the for the public that um, my memo was intentionally put in to support this recommendation so that they would also have this information that they could read and have any questions that they may have and. Um, I feel very confident with the recommendation. Um, and we've obviously discussed it with our admin team. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so there's a recommended motion before you. So moved. And, oh. Oops, sorry. So moved. You want to say it? <laughs> no. <laughs> I just second motion by Ms. Berkman. <laughs> Can't second. say enough how much I want to do this. Ms. Nickerson, all those in favor? Yes. 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 Unanimous seats are carried. I know. Next is a budget transfer request for consideration is a budget transfer to cover the deficit in the Hopkins School Technology Supply Account. There's a recommended motion before you. Are there any comments or questions on the motion? So I'd seek to move to approve the a motion to approve the budget transfer amount of $9,452 as indicated in the agenda materials. So moved. Motion by Mr. Graziano. Seconded. Oh. Second by Ms. Nickerson. All those in favor? Yes. 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 It's unanimous and so carries. There's no old business. We kind of dispensed with public comment early and there's <laughs> no one here. <laughs> now <laughs> we got rid of it. Oh, even better. <laughs> no, we're done. We completed okay, that you. task thank item. You. Now items by consensus, Dr. McLeod. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve the operating budget and other funds more number sixteen dash zero two eight in the amount of four hundred and two thousand six hundred and nine dollars ninety four cents the superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve one hundred thirty five dollars from the sky's the limit fundraiser be placed in the middle school gift account as indicated in the agenda materials sorry so moved Second. motion by Ms. Birchman second by Ms. Nickerson all those in favor yes. yes yes it's unanimous and so carries our next meeting we've already had these two I next meetings um, is January 7th? Mm -hmm. no. no. Yes. Oh, it's 22nd. December 22nd. 22nd. It is in there. Oh, sorry. I just <laughs> <laughs> presented that day already happened. <laughs> I'm sorry. Our next meeting is Tuesday, December 22nd at 6.30. We're meeting in the Central Office Conference Room for a special meeting. And then we have a meeting on January 7th, followed by a meeting on January 21st. And so I'd seek a motion to adjourn. So moved. Seconded. Motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Nickerson. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Unanimous. We're adjourned at 10.09.